afternoon everyone good evening we are at different time zones i'm visara pancheva i'm a professor of art history at stanford university and i'm one of the co-organizers for this event i would like to thank the stanford site um, this is um, nora kalet um, jovana knezevic and uh, pavle levy the um, chair of the art history department and now I would like very briefly to turn to my co-organizer, Professor Nicola Zuther from Yale. Uh, so yes, hello everyone. And um, I would like to uh, thank um, the, uh, the Russian and East, uh, East European study program at Yale for having uh, sponsored the event today. And uh, especially Christina Andriotis and Molly uh, Bronson, and uh, the introduction uh, today. So, so, this is the second part of the webinar. First part uh, was on for, uh, April 1st, and we had uh, Sergei Loshnitsa uh, speaking on his uh, really moving film, Maidan Uprising in Ukraine. And, uh, and uh, today, uh, Bissar Pencheva will introduce into the event. Thank you, Nicola. And I also want to name the um, program that sponsored the events on the Stanford site, the Center for Russian, East European and Eurasian Studies. So I now move to the introduction. Thank you all for coming. The plan is we have three magnificent speakers, very short responses from two of the graduate students, one at uh, Stanford, one at Yale, and then we'll open the floor for discussion. Cultural rights are a necessity, not a luxury, and have inherent importance to human dignity, states Karima Benun, a law professor at UC Davis and United Nations Special Rapporteur in the field of cultural rights from 2015 to 2021. She continues, and I quote, cultural rights include the right to take part in cultural life without discrimination, to access and enjoy cultural heritage, to have artistic and scientific freedom and to benefit from the progress conceived through these endeavors. Artistic expressions have a strong transformative power and can influence society. Humanity reimagines and restores itself through the revising of its cultural life. Cultural rights defenders and artists are at the forefront of resisting oppression and upholding human rights." End of quote. I bring to your attention the legal language of international law as to what constitutes cultural rights, because a new page of awareness has opened linking directly cultural heritage with human rights. This is especially important for cases of armed conflict, be it Yemen or Syria or now Ukraine. As we have seen from the now eight weeks of continuing war in Ukraine, there is an indiscriminate bombing of hospitals, schools, theaters, apartment complexes. Bodies and buildings are linked. Cultural memory inheres to sites, to buildings. Part of the corrosive politics of Putin's Russia is to wipe out not only the infrastructure, but the sites of memory, decimating cities and their inhabitants. Today's session has a modest goal to look through a long durée of Ukrainian art and uncover those special moments in which Ukrainian identity was constructed and negotiated through the artistic production, be it the architecture and decoration of churches, or 20th century avant-garde, or recently, installation and performance art. Our previous session was a discussion with the film director Sergei Loznitsa and his film Maidan, which captures and responds to the 2014 demonstration and regime change up in Ukraine. That conversation, led by Srejan Kecha, um, a colleague of mine at Stanford, touched upon the sense of solidarity, shared goal transforming every scene into a harmoniously composed image, the treatment of people as collective body of resistance, or the role of sound, especially the collective singing of the national anthem, and how this chant emerges in pivotal points of the film or the concept of preserving the dignity of the dead and dying by not filming that violence, which clearly is in contrast to what we are seeing today from the war in Ukraine. Thank you. And now I will turn to our first speaker, uh, distinguished professor, lecturer of 
Ukrainian studies and early modern Slavonic uh, literature and art at Cambridge University, who has published a number of important articles that deal with both the medieval legacy of Byzantium in Ukrainian art and it, its conversation with Western tradition, more specifically Baroque. Olenka, the floor is yours. Thank you, Bistra. So let me just share my screen. Okay. So first I would like to warn our audiences that I do have disturbing images in my presentation. Uh, so if anyone is sensitive, um, please, I don't know, turn off the screen and just listen, but here it goes. In the early hours of February 24th, the Russian Federation launched an unprovoked full-scale invasion of Ukraine by air and sea using tanks, aviation, and rocket launchers. Attacks targeted Kyiv, Kharkiv, Kherson, Chernihiv, Dnipro, Mariupol, and other cities and towns. Torture, rape, and mass murder, sorry. Torture, rape, and mass murder of civilians, including children, the intentional shelling of hospitals and apartment blocks, the deliberate destruction of urban infrastructures, and the bombing of humanitarian corridors are just some of the war crimes being committed in the Russian waged genocide against the Ukrainian nation. This war touches all of us. At stake is the faith of democracy, of freedom, of human rights, and of the international order that has marked our world since the beginning of the 1990s. How can this happen in the 21st century, we wonder? Do we ever learn from the past. In his speeches, President Putin has deceitfully asserted that Ukraine is not a nation, but a Russian territory from which the Bolshevik communists uh, irresponsibly created a Ukrainian state in the 1920s. Like the great Russian theological narrative that gained prevalence in the 19th century Russian empire, and that was propagated and elaborated in Soviet times, he claims that the Russians and Ukrainians are one people who trace their origins to a vast ancient Rus state. This great Russian narrative follows the lineal trajectory from Kiev to the Principality of Vladimir Suzdal to the Grand Duchy and Tsardom of Muscovy, and subsequently to the Russian Empire, the Soviet Union, and today's Russia. This narrative also underpins the field of Slavonic studies in Western educational and academic institutions, where there is a marked reluctance to adopt a decolonization agenda in the teaching and studying of Eastern Europe. I wonder, have we contributed to the resonance of Putin's version of history? All peoples engage in myths of origin that help position them in this world. These myths are subject to transitions and reformations that go hand in hand with changes in knowledge and science, in technology and language. They are spatially situated and ring true within the communities and worlds they define. Today, we all, start, we all stand witness to the fact that Ukrainians do not want Russia to interfere in their domestic affairs. They do not seek Russian liberation. In fact, they are sacrificing their lives to keep Russia out of Ukraine. The people of Ukraine have their own vision of their land, their culture, their history, and their nation. They aspire to be free, to live in a sovereign, independent state, and to make their own choices. They have made these desires clear in numerous referendums and revolutions, since the fall of the Soviet Union and have consistently chosen a path towards Europe and NATO. Perhaps it is time for us to reconsider the place of the great Russian narrative in our educational and research agendas 
and to challenge ourselves by investigating the primary sources that speak of the others that this narrative, this great Russian narrative has obscured. It may be that the future of Eastern European studies no longer lies in the study of Russia, but in the tales of the diverse cultural legacies of the varied peoples that inhabited and inhabit this part of the world. In the current political discourse between Russia and Ukraine, the ownership of medieval Kievan history is once again at stake. However, it is not the present claims to Kiev that I will address today. Rather, I aim to tell the story of Kiev's medieval inheritance from the perspective of the city's early modern inhabitants, as evidenced in the architecture and imagery of the Church of the Savior on the Berestovo Hill. This Kievan church was built in the late 11th, early 12th century and renewed in 1644 under the patronage of Petro Mohela, Metropolitan of Kiev, Halic, and All Rus, an exarch of the throne of Constantinople. At this time, Kiev was part of the Ruthenian Rus lands of the Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth. The renewal of the Church of the Savior witnessed the kaleidoscopic vigor that characterized Ruthenian Rus culture in early modern Kiev. From the amorphous ruins of a medieval church, Metropolitan Mohila brought to life a sacred space that linked Ruthenian Rus Eastern Christianity with Kiev's Christian beginnings. In doing so, Mohila aspired to advance the status of Eastern Christianity and of the Ruthenian Rus nation within the Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth. He envisioned Kiev as a leading center of Christianity positioned between Constantinople and Rome and saw himself as the earthly head of the Ruthenian Rus Orthodox Church. Petro Mohila realized that the Ruthenian Rus Orthodox Church had to adapt to survive and not lose ground to the Catholic and Protestant churches of the Commonwealth. Like many of his erudite Ruthenian contemporaries, he adopted Western practices to suit his needs. His written works, I'm having a little, his written works all sought to clarify and regulate Orthodox custom and practice in response to the demands of a Ruthenian Rus society which although st still Orthodox in the majority, now also was comprised of Catholics and Protestants. In his works, Mohila employed techniques uh, for the systemization of knowledge that relied on both Western European and Byzantine sources. He approached the use of visual culture with a similar reformative hand. Thus, the mid 17th century, forms of the restored church of the, of, at Berestovo do not repeat those of the early Rus period. I'm going to go back a slide because I think I've messed up the orders of the slides. Instead, they negotiate Orthodox traditionalism and notions of Ruthenian ethno-cultural identity with the Reformation and Counter-Reformation developments. Recent scholarship has shown that the, Ruthenian Orth that the Ruthenian Orthodox of the 17th century were conversant with the discipline of memory arts that systemized information by using mnemonic images and uh, schemata. In addition to conjuring the holy, now images served as loci for med meditation, invention, and memory. Such engagement with and reflection upon images enabled sac sacred history to assume approximate relevance. Take, for example, the depiction of the vision of St. Peter of Alexandria, found on the left side of the sanctuary apse in the church at Berestovo. Here, Christ appears to St. Peter as a child wearing a robe uh, torn from top to bottom. St. Peter asks the savior, who tore this garment? And the savior replies, the heretic Arius has torn it by dividing the Christian faithful. 
In Orthodox iconography, this image with the motif of the torn garment came to symbolize church schisms and carried liturgical connotations, the breaking of the Eucharistic bread. In the key of church, we see Peter conversing with the young Jesus who stands on an altar. The inscription reads, who tore your chitin, Savior? And the Savior replies, Arius, the mad and all evil, Peter. The inscribed dialogue plays upon the homonymous relationship of patron and apostle and evokes an immediate relevance in the context of the efforts led by P Metropolitan Mohela to bring uh, an end to the division of the Ruthenian Rus church between those united and those not united with the papacy. The Metropolitan's Testament of 1647 clearly discloses the importance assigned to the Berestava church, but his renewal of this monument resonated beyond the Metropolitan's inner circles. The zealously Orthodox Zaporizhian Cossacks threatened to drown Mohila in the Dnipro River and to lead him to his grave for restoring the ceiling of the Berestava church to resemble a Catholic shrine. They were referencing the decorative rib vaults, framing the Byzantine style frescoes in the sanctuary of the church. And here you see these ribs. The renewed church of the savior is reminiscent of the early uh, 15th century Catholic chapel of the Holy Trinity in the Lublin castle with the rib vaulting of both structures forming a compelling visual parallel. The melding of artistic traditions associated with both Byzantine and Latin Christianity characterized the culturally fluid areas connecting Polish, Lithuanian, and Ruthenian Rus lands. Mohila's early modern renovation of the Church of the Savior looks back to the Lublin tradition and radically transforms it. Whereas in Lublin, Byzantine images decorated the walls and webbing of a Gothic structure used in the service of the Catholic Church, in Kiev, Gothic ribs are added as decorative elements to a structure rooted in, medieval, in the medieval Rus past and used in the service of the Ruthenian Rus Orthodox Church. Within the Berestava church, the imagery of the star-filled heavens in the vault of the narthex, blankets, prophets, scenes of the passion of Christ, and standing monastics that decorate the walls. The imagery links the cosmic and terrestrial, terrestrial realms and aspires to advance the Ruthenian Rus church within universal Christianity. The circular mandala containing the image of Christ is inscribed with the words of the prayer of the pontiff from the little entrance in the pontifical mass. O Lord, our God, look down from the heavens and behold and visit this vineyard, which thy right hand has planted and perfected and fill it with your spirit and bless thy inheritance. The reference of this inscription is clearly Eucharistic. However, these same words also were inscribed on the mitre of York, the first patriarch of Moscow. In 1633, when the Polish King Władysław appointed Mohyla to the Metropolitan Throne of Kiev, his royal title referenced his 1610 election as Grand Duke of Moscovy. Within the Commonwealth, King Władysław was, connected, was concerned to avert the development of bonds between the Orthodox faithful of Ruthenian Rus and Muscovite lands. In 1636, he issued a circular calling on the Ruthenian Rus Orthodox and Ruthenian Rus Catholic churches to join in union, to declare independence from Constantinople and to create their own Cuban patriarchate following Moscow's example. This new patriarchate could then join Rome in the formation of a universal church. Mohila was in favor of the proposal. Nevertheless, due to opposition from both Rome and some Orthodox faithful, the plan never materialized. In 1643, Pope Urban VIII wrote to Mohila, 
calling upon him to bring the Ruthenian Rus Orthodox Church into union with Rome. Mohila was amiable, amiably disposed to the idea and participated in drafting a response to the Pope. The response proposed a compromise regarding the jurisdictional relation of the Kiev Metropolitanate to the Holy See and to the Patriarch of Constantinople. The response preserved the Eastern Rite and positioned the Kiev hierarchy as independent from both Rome and Constantinople with the nominal recognition of papal primacy. Correspondence exchanged between Mohila and the Orthodox Brotherhood of Vilnius indicates that in Orthodox circles, the creation of a patriarchate was considered imminent. The Church of the Savior in Berestovo was renovated concurrently with the drafting of the response to Pope Urban VIII. In the church, Metropolitan Mohila's donor portrait is set over the arch leading into the sanctuary. It shows the mother of God presenting the kneeling metropolitan to Christ who sits enthroned as the great pontiff. Mohila, uh, pontiff, Mohila offers the Berestovo church to Christ. To the other side of Christ stands the haloed Prince Volodymyr, the baptizer of Rus. These are the inscriptions associated with the figure of Mohila and with Christ. And this is Prince Volodymyr. A number of scholars have pondered the significance of the juxtaposition of Mohila, an ecclesiastical hierarch, with Prince Volodymyr. Some have suggested that Mohila traced his own lineage back to Volodymyr, but Mohila was insistent that he was an ecclesiastical and not a secular leader. The Brestova donor portrait does not posit a direct relationship between the Metropolitan and Prince Volodymyr. Rather, it refers to the conditions that preoccupied Mohila and his compatriots in the uh, arbitration of the Ruthenian Rus Church unity and in the mediation of the position of the Ruthenian Church within the Universal Church. In the context of the 1640s, the presence of both Petro Mohila and Prince Volodymyr in the donor fresco should be read against the background of ecclesiastical negotiations that were guided by the nobility, here represented by Volodymyr, and that would bestow patriarchal-like powers on the cave and metropolitan. The column depicted before Prince Volodymyr also has caught the attention of art historians. In the early modern period, the motif of the freestanding column was symbolic of the columns of Hercules and read as a pledge to expand Christian rule to all corners of the earth. Of specific relevance in the context of the Berestova church is the representation of the four patriarchs of Eastern Christianity as the four columns of the church that is found in contemporary Ruthenian Rus texts. It is likely that the column in the fresco was a marker of the extension of Christianity to Rus lands under Prince Volodymyr and a possible symbol of Kiev's anticipated primal dignity, if not pa patriarchal status, primatial dignity, sorry, if not patriarchal patriarchal status in the universal church. In the context of the great Russian narrative, the church of the savior in Berestova is primarily recognized as the mid 12th century burial site of Prince Yuri Dolgoruki, the founder of Moscow. Except for a handful of short articles, the early modern structure and wall paintings of the monument remain unanalyzed. Nevertheless, even this short survey of the church makes clear that for Metropolitan Mohila and his compatriots, early modern Kiev was in no way beholden to Moscow. Kiev was the Ruthenian Rus Orthodox center of the Commonwealth, and as such actively participated in the transnational discourses of the universal church. Or to look at it from another perspective, by confirming the pious traditions and legends surrounding cave in Rus, Metropolitan Mohila and his ecclesiastical literati 
were writing the history of the Ruthenian Rus Church and filling a gap in the narrative of the universal church as drafted by their uh, Roman contemporaries. In either case, the history of Kiev in the early modern period participated in the making of Ukrainian cultural distinctiveness. Thank you, Olenka, uh, for this uh, very insightful talk that shows really um, the um, long tradition of shaping Ukrainian identity, which is continuously negotiated in which the past, the medieval past, appears and is transformed uh, in the Baroque period and then, as we're going to hear uh, from our next speaker, in uh, the early modern as well. So um, I will turn now to our second speaker, uh, Bogdan Tukarski, who finished his uh, PhD at Cambridge University and is now a postdoctoral fellow and lecturer at the University of Potsdam. Bogdan, the word is yours. Thank you so much, dear Bissara, and I'm very grateful to the organizers for holding this extremely important event. And um, I would like to make my small contribution speaking about this middle period, as it were, uh, between, on the one hand, the, the time of the making of the artistic tradition of uh, the initial making of the artistic tradition of Ukraine, and at the same time, the new time after the independence, and to speak specifically about the Ukrainian modernist art. And in fact, the history of Ukrainian modernism is the story of innovation and tradition, cosmopolitanism, and the articulation of national identity. It's also a story of art and politics, of course. And uh, it is an extremely, it is a crucial period, in fact, for uh, understanding both those events that are ongoing, um, unfolding before our eyes as we speak, as, as we hold this event, this uh, Russia's war, horrific war against Ukraine, and uh, on the one hand, it reaches, it is steeped firmly in uh, the Ukrainian artistic tradition that precedes it. And at the same time, it looks forward into the time to come because as uh, I will try to show the importance of this legacy uh, hardly can be overestimated. The importance of this legacy uh, for, for Ukraine today. Of course, at the same time, um, we, sh we should also say that um, many of the patterns that we even see unfolding before our eyes with, with the war that is happening, um, in fact, took place already during this time, 1910s and 1920s. And it is not for nothing that in his pseudo-historical uh, 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 lectures, uh, uh, Putin is trying to make a specific emphasis on these periods of the 1910s and of the 1920s. And so I will try and comment uh, on that as well. But at the same time, we should say that the um, importance of Ukrainian modernism and Ukrainian avant-garde should not be confined uh, to the current events alone, should not be confined to the um, current uh, newspaper reality, as it were. And in fact, it should be given a voice of its own and uh, it should um, be a subject of thorough and, and deep research, which unfortunately has not been um, part of the tradition of uh, modernist studies. In fact, all too often, uh, the Ukrainian avant-garde, Ukrainian modernism more generally, is sorely missing in the studies on, Ukra on, 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 Duke, on uh, uh, modernism, rather, I should say, more generally. And of course, uh, it is high time uh, we, we change this. Uh, so let me start by referring to one specific painting. And in particular, the painting by Vasil Sedlar, one of the Portuguese uh, paintings that uh, pay, uh, 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 artists, that is uh, one of those artists who were part of the Portuguese schools uh, school. That is the school that was headed by Mikhailo Bochuk, uh, one of the leading uh, Ukrainian modernist artists of the uh, 1910s and 1920s. In this painting. 
uh, we can see, and actually, let me show you um, uh, an original, uh, 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 original version of this of this painting, which was preserved through a postcard. We can see uh, a subject matter which would uh, very much conform to the Bolshevik narrative. Uh, it's uh, it dates back to 1927. This painting, so we need to take on board this time as well, and it depicts the the whites killing the peasants. And um, of course, uh, on the level of the subject matter, this painting does conform to the narrative that the Bolsheviks were trying to impose and co-opt art in, in articulating and promoting uh, this narrative. But at the same time, this painting is an epitome of quite a few important aspects that I would like to raise uh, today within, within the time that I have. So on the one hand, uh, and this, uh, the title of this painting, very importantly, is uh, the execution in Majahiriya, right? Uh, very tragically, uh, this execution uh, act in this diabolical reversal of history later on within just a decade uh, happened to Vasil Sedlar himself and the whole of the Bolshevikist uh, school. And indeed, Vasil Sedlar and, along uh, Mikhailo Bochuk and other artists from the school were executed during Stalin's great terror, along with the absolute majority of Ukrainian modernist figures. Um, very important element uh, of this painting and uh, the reason why, uh, one of the, the reasons why uh, Vasil Sedlar himself was executed, and in fact the painting was as executed, uh, as you can see uh, uh, on, on this slide, the, the current state of the painting, uh, most likely uh, an attempt to destroy the painting by using acid um, by, by the Bolsheviks. Um, so destroying art along with, with the artists. Uh, so we can see that even though, uh, in terms of the subject matter, this painting conforms to the uh, narrative, uh, the Bolshevik narrative, in terms of the actual form and the uh, performance or the uh, pictorial elements of this, of this painting, it does not necessarily uh, fit easily into the uh, nascent uh, Soviet canon. Uh, we can look at these elements, uh, specific elements in the painting, which have a really uh, poignant relevance, uh, given the uh, events of the war uh, today as well, because this painting uh, really captures uh, the uh, excruciating emotions that uh, people are going through in Ukraine uh, as we speak. And uh, here, indeed, uh, parts of the uh, the difference or part of the way in which uh, Sedlar is at odds with the Bolshevik uh, narrative or with the, the uh, socialist realist approach uh, is by referring back to the, uh, uh, to the previous tradition and in particular the Italian Renaissance tradition or Giotto, for example, uh, who was uh, a great authority for the Portuguese artists. And so in many such ways, this painting is of course at odds uh, with the art that or was imposed and the artistic principles that were imposed on the artists. And the uh, this very place of Majahiria, which was uh, where the um, Institute of Ceramics was established back in the early 1920s, uh, where Sedlar, along with other Portuguese artists, worked has a great significance as well, because it was a seed and a place for the Majahiria monastery that's coming back to the period uh, that uh, uh, Olenka uh, uh, has already uh, uh, told us uh, about just now. Uh, this monastery was demolished in the 1930s. And so uh, this place of Majahiria has a very important uh, role in that sense as well, a site of the destruction of art and the, uh, and the tradition in this sense. And uh, this monastery was turned instead into a state Dacia, and then very sadly later on uh, was appropriated by Viktor Yanukovych, uh, whom I'm sure you have heard of. Uh, so the topic of our uh, conversation tonight is moments and movements, and indeed movement is at the very heart of Ukrainian modernism and, and avant-garde, as it is at the heart of uh, avant-garde and modernism generally, of course. Uh, whether we look at uh, uh, the visual uh, arts, 
uh, and specifically uh, at uh, uh, fine arts. And we look, for example, at a painting like the one you see on the left by Alexander Bohumazov, tram from 1914, really capturing this dynamic nature of movement related to the process of modernization and urbanization. Whether we look, for example, at the theater, uh, modernist innovative theater created by Les Courbas, uh, the leading uh, innovative revolutionary, we could say, uh, uh, theater director uh, for uh, the 1920s and 1930s in Ukraine. Um, and you can see on the right um, an image from one of his productions where uh, movement has such a central role. And I, I will speak about that more in a second. Um, movement also plays an extremely important role in a very physical sense, in the sense of traveling, which uh, there was a, a striking amount of traveling, in fact, in the 1910s and 1920s. And uh, many of the artists who either were at the very core of the Ukrainian modernist movement uh, or uh, contributed uh, to it a lot, uh, in fact, traveled to uh, other uh, European countries, to other European cities, be it Berlin or Paris or Munich or Zurich, and uh, many of them studied there. Uh, so Les Kurbas himself uh, uh, visited uh, these cities, some of these cities, Mikhailo Burchuk did, Alexandra Ekster, and many, many other artists. At the same time, movement is very important when we speak about the notion of national and artistic affiliations and hyphenated identities as well, because, uh, of course, so much uh, of Ukrainian art uh, has been subsumed uh, very erroneously and very unfortunately and tragically uh, uh, has been subsumed, subsumed within the notion of Soviet or even worse, Russian. And that is how uh, this art is very uh, often either ignored uh, completely or included into this umbrella uh, uh, misnomer of the Russian avant-garde. And that is another extremely crucial uh, aspect uh, because many of the artists that we know as traditionally uh, traditionally known as part of the Russian avant-garde, uh, be it uh, again Alexander Ekster, uh, or uh, be it uh, uh, David Burluk, or be it Kazimir Malevich, were in fact people of multiple hyphenated identities, both in terms of their national affiliation and in terms of their artistic affiliation as well. And even a quick look at uh, at, at places, for example, at Kyiv, uh, already gives us a very clear idea about how dynamic and diverse this environment was, and that we by no means can confine it to the notion of uh, the Russian avant-garde. Uh, either when we look at the uh, Kyiv art school, uh, they had a great number of uh, uh, really prominent um, uh, graduates, uh, be it Alexander Ekster or Vadim Meller or Ivan Kavalaridze and many others. Whether we look at, uh, for example, the 1908 uh, so-called uh, uh, Lanka or Zvino uh, or, or Link exhibition, one of the first, uh, first avant-garde exhibitions uh, that took place in Kyiv. Uh, and many other examples or the, uh, the activities of the Kultur League uh, in, in Ukraine uh, in, in the early 20th century, which made uh, Kyiv uh, into one of the centers of the Yiddish uh, art, the, the Yiddish culture uh, as well, or the Ukrainian Art Institute, uh, where Kazimir Malevich and Vladimir Tatlin and Mikhailo Burchuk taught uh, uh, in the late 1920s, and where Malevich, whose art wasn't welcome anymore in, in Moscow and Leningrad, uh, taught at this time and wrote a great number of works uh, which uh, were published in, in Nova Generatia Journal, for example, edited by um, Mikhail Simonko, the, the uh, central futurist in Ukraine. Uh, so this uh, clearly shows to us uh, the importance of movement in this sense and, the, and Kyiv and Ukraine in general being this crisscross of influences and contexts, be it Ukrainian or Russian or Jewish or Western uh, European. Now, uh, when it comes to moments next to uh, movements, um, a very crucial moment for Ukrainian history, and one that had also great impact on the development of Ukrainian culture, uh, was uh, the 1917 revolution. And when I say the, when I use the definitive article, uh, again here, uh, notice that 
um, I, I use it not to refer to the, the 1917 revolution as is commonly the case to speak about the Russian revolution of 1917, but to the Ukrainian revolution, which was one of the multiple national revolutions that took place over the territory of the former Russian empire. And again, that uh, calls into question the, uh, uh, the simplistic uh, and misnomian notion of uh, the uh, revolution. Here you can see a manifestation that took place on the 19th of March, where thousands of people took to the streets uh, in this act of liberation and acts of renewal, welcoming the uh, emergence of a new state, uh, welcoming the emergence of a new page in the history of uh, uh, de development of, of the Ukrainian nation. And uh, up, uh, according to some memoirs, uh, there were up to 100,000 people who took place, uh, who, who took part uh, in, in these manifestations, which of course uh, very much calls into question, even though I, I don't want to comment on it more, uh, Putin's quasi-historian uh, 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 references to uh, Ukraine called after Lenin, uh, uh, and cannot, of course, explain where these thousands, dozens of thousands of people came from uh, in 1917. And uh, this moment of national elation was uh, really captured uh, uh, in uh, uh, Alexander Dovzhenko's film, Arsenal. Uh, and uh, you can see some frames from it. You can see this image next to uh, St. Sophia Cathedral, and you can see Dovzhenko himself being there. And indeed, Dovzhenko eventually rewrote his own biography because to begin with, he was fighting on the side of the ONR, uh, the Ukrainian People's Republic, and uh, eventually in this film he was trying to show the attack on Arsenal on the other side, um, showing it from the Bolshevik perspective, even though he was one of those soldiers who were actually attacking the Bolsheviks uh, during the um, uh, during the moment, uh, historical moment of the attack of the Arsenal factory in 19. 18. Uh, so very quickly, I can see that I have um, a couple of minutes left. I would also like to say that a very distinctive um, feature of Ukrainian modernism was the fact that even though there were, of course, um, many examples of where tradition and innovation was uh, were combined in the history of modernism, in the Ukrainian case, uh, innovation was largely created through uh, tradition. And there are multiple examples of that. And as I'm short of time, I, I want to give, just give one specific example of the uh, productions uh, uh, by Les Kurbas, uh, like I mentioned, the leading uh, innovative theater director uh, in, in the Ukrainian 1920s and 1930s, who uh, directed a number of productions that involved elements of the Baroque theater, uh, this, uh, uh, this, uh, of the Vartap theater, this Baroque puppet theater and a nativity, a nativity scene reaching back to the tradition of the uh, 16th and uh, 17th, uh, mostly 17th century. And again, trying to combine on the one hand, this reference to the past, reference to the theatrical tradition, and at the same time, the use of modernist uh, innovation uh, in his production of 1919, for example, which was specifically uh, called Vartap, he was trying to use this nativity scene and these uh, scenes from the Baroque theater, uh, but using that not as, as, as a puppet theater, as a two-story small wooden box, but rather to have his actors actually perform the roles of the, uh, of the puppets, saying that this production on the one hand uh, is uh, really steeped in the tradition of, our, of, of the Ukrainian theater, but at the same time is really innovative in the way it treats the body. Uh, uh, he says we should distance ourselves from ourselves, we should forget the human logic, we should act uh, like a puppet uh, would act. So again, this beautiful organic combination of the tradition and the national aspect, but at the same time, this universal modernist idiom. Uh, there are multiple other examples of how uh, this, um, how these elements of tradition and innovation were combined. You can see uh, this futurist, uh, futuristic uh, poetry of Mikhail Semenko on the right, uh, next to uh, some examples of Baroque poetry on the left. Uh, but, uh, and you can see some paintings by Mikhailo Buchuk as well, who was combining these 
elements of using elements of mosaic and iconography um, and uh, uh, elements of uh, uh, reference to the uh, Kievan uh, medieval uh, 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 legacy and heritage as well in creating his modernist art. This period, the modernist period in Ukraine is most commonly referred to as executed Renaissance and there are many caveats about this notion, but very sadly, it also does convey the painful historical truth about the fact that Ukrainian modernists were executed en masse. The vast majority of uh, uh, Ukrainian modernists uh, were executed, including Les Kurbas, including Mikhailo Burchuk, including Vasil Sedlar, uh, with his, uh, whose work I started with. Uh, and this is an example uh, of how this trauma uh, uh, is reactivated, as it were. On the left, you can see uh, the uh, uh, Slovo House, which was a home to a great number of Ukrainian modernists uh, in Kharkiv, uh, which was uh, the Ukrainian capital and the capital of Ukrainian modernism at this, uh, at this time, and which was uh, most recently bombed uh, and shelled, rather, uh, during this war. Um, you can also see the example Kharkiv being uh, one of the centers of uh, Soviet constructivism as well. And I'm sure that you, uh, you all would have heard about the bombing of the Freedom Square at the very center, the very heart, the biggest, the largest square uh, in Europe, the very heart of Kharkiv, right next to the uh, building of Drashprom, uh, this uh, one of these masterpieces of, of Soviet con constructivism. Uh, and all this art that was executed, not only the artists were executed, but uh, the, the art itself was erased from uh, the public discourse in the Soviet Union and was only rediscovered to begin with in the 1960s, but mostly in the 1990s. And uh, to end my presentation, I just want to say that uh, in the 1990s, uh, Ukrainian artists and Ukrainian public at large uh, only started to discover mostly this incredible uh, heritage, this incredible uh, art from the 1920s, from the 1930s, which was uh, erased and annihilated uh, by, by the subsequent uh, Soviet uh, purges. And uh, the, uh, that's one of the reasons why Ukrainian modernism from the time has such a crucial role to play uh, for Ukrainians today. And that is why, uh, of course, uh, it is so relevant in the context um, of this war. And modernism is not just one period among, among many others, but rather a period that uh, has is bound up firmly with such questions as cultural memory, as trauma, as discovery of art, as women's art. And uh, for this reason, among many other reasons, has to be studied. Thank you so much for, for your attention. Bogdan, thank you very much uh, for this another magnificent talk that joins uh, Olenka and maybe I could bring back the words of Olenka that to, we need to decolonize uh, your um, Eastern European studies. This is really at the core and both talks are really consistently showing that there are moments in which incredible artistic synthesis is created in order to negotiate an Ukrainian identity. Uh, what we saw with Ulenka, Medieval and uh, Baroque and what we saw with uh, Bogdan is this um, drawing on both Medieval um, um, Byzantine examples as well as Western Renaissance and Baroque to create avant-garde and also relying so much of the legacy of the Baroque in Ukraine. So it is in step in a sense. It reminds me of um, the inscription on the tomb of Freud in Vienna that the scholar speaks softly, but it will not, but he would not or she would not rest until it's heard. So um, I now turn to Elisa, who um, is um, a PhD student in the Central European University in uh, Budapest and whose work is uh, focused on contemporary art. And it is uh, our, she is our eyes uh, to the uh, very rich contemporary art scene in Ukraine.
at least uh, the word is yours. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to participate in this awesome uh, seminar. I think it's extremely important to 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 speak about this uh, uh, this uh, long uh, long uh, history of Ukrainian art and how it like it interacts like different periods like uh, uh, reflect each other in a way. So uh, today I will be speaking about. Um, art of the last uh, three decades. I'm not focusing today particularly on the art of the war because it's another big and important uh, topic, but today we will see uh, the conditions which uh, made it possible for Ukrainians to realize uh, this, uh, um, their identity as a separate nation, as a separate uh, independent state. And uh, through uh, drastic transformations in Ukrainian recent art history and Ukrainian contemporary art as well. I'll start sharing my screen one one second so yeah uh, in the last uh, three decades, uh, Ukraine went through three major socio-historical milestones which shaped the country's political and cultural landscape. These events deeply transformed Ukrainian society and coincided with three major waves of artistic activity in the country. Artists were not only influenced by the historic transformations, but became important agents of social change who directly participated in the events and to a certain extent shaped them. In the, end of, in the end of 1980s and at the beginning of 1990s was the time when Ukraine was transforming from one of the Soviet republics into an independent state. This brought a lot of challenges and first of all posed the question of national identity, which both the artists and the society on the whole were trying to conceptualize at the time. All three waves of mass mobilization in recent Ukrainian history were centered around the Ukrainian capital's main square. In 1990, it was called the Square of the October Revolution, and since 1991, its official name is Independent Square, Maidan Nezalezhnosti in Ukrainian. The first mass turbulence, the Granite Revolution, lasted from October 2nd to October 17th, 1990, and took its name from the material that Kyiv's central square was made of. The protest consisted of a hunger strike of the members of the Lviv Students' Brotherhood and the Ukrainian Students' Union. By the time of the Granite Revolution, the language of political performance was already a familiar tool of artistic expression in uh, Soviet Ukraine. Back in 1989, uh, the Youth Revolutionary Patriotic Union, called the Rays of Juche, was created in Kyiv. The organization, which in fact was an art project in disguise, was invented by students Mikola Polishuk and Metro Polichovich. The Rays of Juche is a bright page of early Ukrainian political performance. The peak of the group's activity was 1990 and 1991. Burlesque actions and interventions of the Rays of Juche were mocking the ideology of North Korean communists and in particular the magazines Korea and Korea Today. The propaganda editions of the Korean communists in the late Soviet era looked like an ideal art parody of the decaying USSR with its pompous slogans and excessive rituals. Juche was a local North Korean leader Kim Il-sung uh, version of Korean Marxism. Armed with a masquerade North Korean entourage, the young founders of the Rays of Juche dissected the absurdity of Soviet everyday reality. Another important phenomenon of the era was the so-called Mazov Fund art group from Lviv. Among the fund's most famous projects was the Mausoleum for the President, uh, made in 1994, a performance near the National Art Museum in, of Ukraine in Kyiv. The event was held on the eve of the second presidential election in the history of independent Ukraine. Artists invited guests to the opening of their art uh, performance without giving any additional details. At the appointed place at the entrance of the main uh, art museum of the country, the audience saw a mysterious object covered with white clothes. When the performance began, the fabric was removed and under it there appeared a three liter jar with traditional Ukrainian lard. Putting the jar on a portable hot plate, the artists began to slowly melt the fat. 
When the light got transparent, the viewer saw in a jar the portrait of Ukraine's first president, Leonid Kuchma. Oh, Kravchuk, I'm sorry. Uh, the provocative political action was accompanied by a fiery speech by one of the group's members, Igor Podolchak, on the steps of the museum and caused a big scandal. Uh, the next turn in the development of contemporary art in Ukraine happened in 2004 and was influenced by another wave of political protests in the country. A new generation of artists emerged. It was ideologically opposed to those uh, who came in late 1980s and early 1990s. From November 22nd through December 26, 2004, Ukraine again faced a large-scale wave of political protests. They were again uh, centered around Kyiv's main square, the Maidan of Independence. A quick rise of oligarchy was one of the main problems of the era. The country's enormous resources fell into the hands of several warring political and economic groups. The Orange Revolution and its pre-election campaign, according to the Swedish economist and diplomat Anders Aslund, were the struggle of millionaires against billionaires. But it, also, it was also a protest of the nascent middle class, the voice of the generation that had formed after the collapse of the USSR and did not want to live in the country ruled by corrupt politicians, ultra-rich oligarchs and gangsters. Orange Revolution, as its name implies, had a distinctive aesthetic component. Bright energetic color became a marker of protesters, protesters and filled Ukraine's capital and other cities. Some researchers called the event of 2004 the Orange Visual Revolution and interpreted them as the destruction of the classical symbol of power, system of power by means of postmodern technologies. In 2004, despite the unprecedented concentration of people in the center of Kyiv and their protest mood, the situation was absolutely non-violent. I'll get back to a couple of pictures. These are very uh, symptomatic. <laughs> and uh, uh, the main tool of political resistance was artistic expression, folk performances, costume uh, marches with their specific humor, slogans and songs. Uh, the atmosphere of orange protests saturated with visual symbols was documented by two video artists from Odessa, Gleb Kachuk and Olga Kashimbekova, in their short uh, film, The Velvet Labyrinth, made in 2004. On the last night before the dismantlement of the revolutionary tents and barricades, the artists walked along Kyiv's main street from Kreshatik uh, metro station to the Maidan of Independence. They filmed winter barricades and their inhabitants twined with orange ribbons. To these visually expressive panoramas, artists added even stranger elements using the computer graphics. Among everyday scenes from the life of a dying protest, with all the political slogans and abundance of orange color, an image of Mona Lisa suddenly appears. Barbie and Ken toys radiantly smile from the barricades, and in a couple of meters, a space rocket takes off. Gradually, it becomes obvious that the whole performance is the theater of absurd or a vivid but meaningless hallucination. In this atmosphere, that the new gen is was that the new generation of artists comes to uh, onto the scene. It all starts on the Maidan. Revolutionary carnival stimulates the release of adrenaline and creative energy. Young students of the National Academy of Art, as well as recent graduates of and other creative personalities, take part in the protests. Very soon, the director of former George Soros Center of Contemporary Art, Jerzy Onoch, offered them an artistic residence at the Antrit Center. After a few weeks, on December 2004, an exhibition titled Revolutionary, Revolutionary Experimental Space opened. It gave birth to one of the most prominent art collectives of the 2000s, the Rap Group. If more involvement in the practices of street democracy during the Orange Revolution, along with interest in the legacy of Moscow actionism, gave impetus to the formation of a recognizable language of the group's early works. 
RAP begins to work as a collective author, focusing on actions interventions into the public space. In the 2005 project, the revolutionary drive with its collective party energy is still tangible. At the same time, a critical vector is already being outlined here. It will become a hallmark of all future projects of the group. The romantic mood is being replaced by time to ask questions about the outcome of the protests. Rap's action intervention and we will wrap you are built according to a similar scenario. A group of performers invites the fabric of the reel and using it as a decoration creates its own burlesque performance. We Will Rap You takes place on November 7th amid a demonstration by the Communist Party and a rally of nationalists accompanied by a prayer service. A critical aspect comes to the fore here. Disguised performers become a mirror of society where political masquerade has become a topical phenomenon. In October 2005, the Soska Art Group appeared on the Kharkiv stage. Its path in art was in many ways similar to the Kiev's rap. It became obvious that a new generation of artists had come to the scene who shared the same views and methods. Like rap, the Soska group in its first projects used the elements of the language of the Royal Orange Revolution's political protests. Future members of Soska had a critical view of the surrounding reality even before they created the group. In October 2004, on the eve of mass protests of Kiev's Maidan, future members of the group Mykola Ridny and Bela Logachova held a performance in Kharkiv Municipal Gallery. They splashed white paint on the portraits of all the politicians participating in the election race. The initial stage of the group's activity coincides with the period of political turbulence in the country, which is reflected in Soska's works. Mykola Ridney, Anna Krivintsova, and Sergei Popov's action, They Are on the Street, uh, which was made in 2006, is very symptomatic in this context. On the eve of the election, the artists asked for alms, wearing masks of Ukrainian politicians, the president, prime minister, and opposition leader. Absurd scenes in the subway and on the streets of Kyiv with the participation of talking heads from TV became a metaphor for the state of Ukraine where politicians were fabulously enriched, turning into puppets for large oligarchs and the country continued to drown in poverty. The artists of the post-Orange wave were deeply interested in critical art, the left-wing optics, and political activism. It is no coincidence that their criticism was focused on the post-Soviet rather than Soviet society, with its prolonged political crisis and conflict of values. Unlike the artists who emerged during perestroika, this circle embraced the leftist critical optics and apparatus, which they did not associate with the trauma of Ukraine's communist past anymore. Moreover, they recognized the political element in art in the same manner as it was understood by the international leftist intellectuals and political artists of the time. Uh, The revolution of dignity uh, happened uh, started in November on November 21st 2013 and lasted till February 22nd 2014. It was the first and by now the most dramatic turbulence in the newest Ukrainian history. Turbulence, I mean, uh, without uh, the intervention of other countries. A number of uh, young artists who sided with the informal uh, Bacteria Gallery joined the protests at the early stage. Most active among them were Oleg Saman, Ivan Semisuk, and Andriy Yermolenko. In 2013, they broke into the Ukrainian art scene with flamboyant works that reflected ironically on the most unsavory sides of the new Ukrainian realities, including the life of thugs, roughnecks, and other uh, residents of the lumpenized outskirts of Ukrainian metropolises. The Maidan became this artist's true finest hour. They did not leave the barricades even in the bloodiest days and set up a makeshift gallery and the communication center on the barricades at the entrance to the Maidan right in the middle of Khrushchev Street. It was very aptly named Mestetsky Barbican, the art bar Barbican, Barbican being a defensive out outwork of medieval fortifications designed to protect the city gates. 
the shock caused by the bloody events and the end of uh, at the end of Maidan protests, Russian annexation of Crimea and the beginning of the war in Donbas have become a traumatic experience for Ukrainian artistic community. For many artists who took active part in the Maidan event, uh, events, this period was the time uh, of a post-revolutionary hangover, an emotional drama that was hard to express in a single artwork. To others, on the contrary, this very period gave impetus to work on new subjects, problems, and projects. A noticeable phenomenon, uh, phenomenon was the documentaries about the Maidan and further events made by film director and artist Oleksiy Radinsky, an activist of the Visual Culture Research Center. Particularly important was his film People Who Came to Power, uh, made in 2015, co-authored with Slovakian artist and filmmaker Tomas Rafa, focused on the initial stages of the conflict in Eastern Ukraine. At this period, a new generation of artists made its debut on the art scene. Oh, sorry. Uh, its most interesting uh, representative was Roman Mikhailov from Kharkiv. In 2014, the artist created Shadows, the installation showing scorched shipwrecks. In this piece, Mikhailov reflects upon the Russian annexation of Crimea and the destiny of the Black Sea uh, Navy fleet that had become the bone of contention between Russia and Ukraine for decades. Another important Mikhailov's project began at Maidan, where the artist hot smoked the paper for graphic works over the burning barrels in the tent camp behind the barricades. Later, the series developed into gigantic sheets of scorched paper. One of the most politically engaged female artists of the post-Maidan epoch is Maria Kulikovska. Her performance at the 2014 Manifesta in St. Petersburg became enormously famous. To protest against the Russian annexation of Crimea and the war in Eastern Ukraine, she wrapped herself up in the Ukrainian flag on one of the Hermitage state cases. No less famous was her uh, performance, the Crimea float board, during which the artist drifted on a float board down the Dnieper without any food uh, reserve in order to emphasize the vulnerability of people who lost their homes and native land after the annexation of Crimea. Before the Maidan revolution, Kulikovska started a series that featured the castings of her own body. Her works from this series were exhibited, among others, at the only contemporary art institution in Donetsk, the Isolatia Art Center. During the armed conflict in Donetsk, the factory that housed this institution was taken over by separatists and Russian soldiers who turned the art center into a prison for pro-Ukrainian people and executed symbolically Maria Kulikovska sculptures by using them for target practice. In 2015, in remembrance of this event, the artist staged her performance Happy Birthday at the Saatchi Gallery in London. In the course of this performance, the naked artist hammered down the soap castings of herself as an answer to the separatists who destroyed her artworks. Kiev artist Vlada Ralko was perhaps the best to catch the growing tragedy of Maidan. Her Kiev diary is based on her day-to-day -day observations of the events. It is a graphic series that records the emotion and feelings of almost every day between December, 13, uh, to, to, between December 2013 and a relative de-escalation of the war in the Donbas in 2015. The challenges of the second half of the 2010s inspired a significant wave of cultural activity in Ukraine and brought a new ambitious generation to the art scene. The rage of revolution and war, political and economic instability within the country, mixed with the anxieties and uncertainties of contemporary world in general. In the narrow space between all the turbulences and challenges, a territory of new freedom was blossoming. In the next several years of the revolution of dignity, Ukraine capi Ukraine's capital, Kyiv, became one of the world capitals of the rave movement. Dance culture became an antidote to deep trauma and political absurd. The paradox of young Ukrainian art is that, is that it combines the escapism and the phantasmal psychedelic experience of the rave with highly political senses and projects. The works of contemporary Ukrainian artists are highly critical and reflect the experience of existing in the context of constant unrest.
And uh, to end my presentation, I want to say that there is something that connects all our three speeches. And this is Mezhihiria. Mezhihiria, which was the monastery in the medieval uh, Ukraine, then was this uh, scene of this uh, execution uh, showed by Bogdan in his uh, slides. And again, in my personal story, it was a very important uh, uh, place because in 2014, uh, days after uh, our ex-president Viktor Yunikov escaped from his luxurious uh, uh, palace in Mezhihiria, uh, which costed probably billions of dollars, I was among uh, a group of museum workers who were trying to prevent the looting in the Mezhihiria. And we spent like several weeks documenting the, uh, the um, how to say, it, the aftermath of the revolution and uh, the peaceful takeover of this palace, uh, uh, which now belongs uh, to Ukrainian people and where now the great park is situated. And I also, with my colleague and artist Alexander Reutberg, created an exhibition of the so-called treasures of Mezhigiria, uh, this uh, weird mix of kitschy golden uh, chandeliers and uh, really expensive artworks, icons, uh, old manuscripts, everything that was like given to our former president, Viktor Yanukovych's presence and bribes, and which was abandoned in this uh, estate and given after the revolution by uh, the self-defense troops uh, to the Ukrainian museums. Thank you very much. Elisa Luskina, thank you very much for this fascinating talk that uh, brings the different um, aspects of decolonizing Eastern European studies uh, in focus. And now I'm going to turn to the two respondents. Um, one is the first person who will speak is um, Daria Storoschuk, who is a PhD student in uh, Russian and Eastern European studies here at Stanford. And the second speaker is going to be Lilia Dashevsky, who is a PhD student also in Russian and Eastern European Studies at Yale. I'm not going to introduce them further, so first Dari is going to speak for approximately five minutes, and then the word will go to Lilia. Thank you both, so Dari. Thank you. Um, thank you all for your, for your wonderful, incisive talks uh, and for being so generous with your time today and sharing your research with us. Um, as Bisra said, I'm in the interest of leaving as much time as possible for discussion. I'm just going to jump right into my comments and questions. Lydia will follow, and then we'll turn things back over to the panelists for their responses and, and to start off the general discussion. Um, so first, Olenka, thank you so much. Um, to echo Bisra, I think your call for an attention to decolonializing scholarship is so important, um, especially in this moment where, as you noted, memory politics are playing such an active role in the current political discourse. And indeed, that tension that you draw out in the Mohila era um, of Ukrainian visualities positioning between the, the Byzantine East and, the, and Western Europe continues to be really actual today, um, even and perhaps especially, I think, beyond the visual, we're continually seeing it drawn upon as a really powerful and present opposition. Um, in today's talk and elsewhere in your work as well, you engage this tension between Ukraine's inheritance of Orthodox Byzantine forms and its engagement of, of uh, Western European Reformation and counter-Reformation developments as a working out of a kind of cultural distinctiveness, uh, which eventually comes to underlie the signification of national difference. Um, and while I think in the wake of Russia's invasion, invasion of Ukraine, there's something particularly important in this moment uh, in delineating a Ukrainian distinctiveness, which is not assimilable into the great Russian narrative that you talk about. I wonder if that national frame, which engages images primarily as indices of identity, can sometimes tend towards making all images commensurate across uh, style, uh, precisely in their indexical capacity, and as a result, elide transformations which may occur in visual experiences, um, you know, which attend to these shifts in style. And that seems especially important to me in, in discussing religious images, which are very much objects of use. They're carried and prayed and wept over, um, you know, by individual human bodies in lived spaces, in addition to also, of course, being objects which play into uh, political or ecumenical considerations in Ukraine's sort of self-determining its orientation towards either the West, be it the papacy of the Mohila era or, you know, the EU of today, or the East in the, in the Byzantine tradition, um, which in the current situation is increasingly being rhetorically subsumed into a kind of um, Russian neo-imperial impulse in a very troubling way, I think. 
Um, so I wonder if you could speak a little bit to how you understand the relationship of these really monumental stylistic shifts and this very interesting recombination in the Ukrainian context of Byzantine or Kievan Rus elements with Latin or Western European ones. Um, if, if you can talk about their relationship to historical changes in visual experience, um, which may or may not fall along these same lines of, of Byzantine East and European West. So what kinds of transformations are occurring in the ways that people see and so perhaps also use these very stylistically different images? Um, how are the, the subjectivities that are being formed by these images affected by transformations in the style or stated otherwise, what kinds of shifts do the interpretive skills <laughs> and strategies of the inhabitants of early modern cave, which you talk about, um, have to undergo in order to countenance these transformations in visual style, which are being affected by really powerful figures like Mohila. Um, second, Bukhtan, um, you're, uh, I so, I so appreciate your attention to the specificity and importance of terminology, so thank you for that. Um, you touched on today and, and in the, the longer essay that you shared with us as well, um, the sort of uh, common and incorrect conflation of Russian and Soviet culture, both of which often subsume Ukrainian culture uh, in scholarship and in, in broader public consciousness. And I wonder if you can speak to how you see this terminology and its associated memory politics playing out in the contemporary in scholarship and in uh, current political discourse in the context of the war. Uh, we heard Alisa talk about a shift in contemporary art away from responding uh, to the Soviet legacy uh, towards something else. Um, so this is perhaps a question not only for Bohdan, <laughs> uh, but I think we, at least in the diaspora, we, we skew towards seeing the Soviet legacy everywhere. Uh, and so I'm wondering how you, as somebody who has given a lot of thought to this terminological tension, uh, how you see it playing out in the present. Uh, and then finally, Alisa, um, there's an undercurrent throughout your talk of the Maidan, or in the first wave you describe of the, the square of the October Revolution as the stage for many of these art actions. And I think that your talk reads in a way um, as a kind of history of that space, as much as an overview of the artists that inhabit it. So I wonder if you can first speak to the significance of the public square for public performance art. How does it function? Uh, what does it enable or authorize? And then second, in, in um, in some of the, the later uh, artists that you discuss, you, you, we have this movement of some artists into museum spaces. And I'm curious to hear what you think changes, if anything, um, in that movement. What is lost or perhaps gained um, in that translation from the immediacy and urgency of the, the public stage or the ad hoc gallery of the open air square into the institutionalized art space? And does one's engagement with these political art actions change with that shift in space or place? Um, so I'll leave it there and, and pass the baton to Yulia. Can I add something? Is it possible for all of us to hold that many questions in our mind? So it might actually be wiser if we now give the word in, in the order the questions were uh, received, first to Olenka, then to Bogdan, and then to Elisa, and then Lilia, it will be your turn. I just think that it will be, it will be saturated with questions. Yes, and I think that's a good idea. And maybe uh, Lydia, um, uh, you answer to one, and then maybe uh, the question, uh, the answer comes immediately after the question, and then you can turn uh, to the second speaker if this is possible in your presentation, I don't know. Okay, so I'll begin. Is that okay? <laughs> um, Daria, thank you for putting so much thought into my presentation to begin with. Um, and I really appreciate it. And of course, everything you see, the, what you're picking up on is, is very true. Uh, I would like to say that um, I feel that the study of Ukrainian visual culture, uh, especially Ukrainian or visual culture on Ukrainian territory, as it might be, uh, is still in its very empirical stage. So it's very hard to answer certain questions because the monuments haven't really been studied. They haven't even been photographed or um, recorded fully. So every time you take on a monument, I think you're discovering something new. So one of the things I would say is, I don't think there was such a sudden shift. So um, partially, uh, I think that the development of, for example, Gothic architecture in certain parts of Ukraine or elements of Gothic architecture infiltrated Byzantine architecture gradually in the connections with Poland. So I think the way we conceive of Rus, 
needs to be changed. So for example, we tend to think of Rus, you know, with borders and as a state and attribute it to Byzantium and orthodoxy. But in fact, there were many Rus principalities and each Rus principality had different neighbors and interacted with different neighbors. So in certain um, Western principalities, you already had this tradition of um, Gothic elements were entering into this architecture or visual culture. And I think one of the things, uh, you know, Mohila, before he came to, to Kiev, spent a lot of time in uh, Lviv and the Western parts of Ukraine. So he was, this culture was not something that he thought he was uh, building something new. I mean, I'm not in his mind. I'm projecting my, my, um, I don't know, impersonation of Mohila. Every time I study a figure, I feel like I'm embodying them in some way. Um, but, you know, so I don't, I feel like he saw, it wasn't, um, it was something he saw around him, do you know, that, he, and he saw it, for example, in the chapel in, in Lublin, Lublin, this is where um, the Commonwealth was formed, right? The Treaty of Lublin, where that formed the Commonwealth was there. And he saw his fatherland as the Commonwealth, right? So he saw his fatherland as the Commonwealth. His identity was of the nobility in the Commonwealth. And he also knew that he, uh, he was Orthodox and that an orthodoxy had been repressed, right? So I think he was trying to conceive of a church in the context of the Commonwealth and saw this, all of this as part of his inheritance. I do think that um, there is a change in the way imagery is being read. And I think this has to do with Baroque culture and the whole, uh, you know, if you just think of emblems, and the way emblems function and the way texts are associated with emblems. So I think um, you need to look at both literature and imagery and how the images and literature uh, interact. And this has to do with the publications that you know, uh, Mohila uh, patronizes with the poetry of the period that gives you these lines of poetry with just an emblematic image from which you're, that you're supposed to interpret. So I think that there's among the elite already this change in the way um, images are viewed, or maybe I wouldn't say change, but an additional element to the viewing culture. The problem is that we of course only know what the elite has left us. So I can't tell you what the, a uh, person who worships icon or venerates icons ra rather, um, you know, would think about these images. Uh, I can tell you what the elite would, the way they would approach um, icons. But I do think that what we see is this new Jesuit learning spreading throughout Ukraine that impacts um, the viewing culture. And I found, I thought I was very lucky to find that quote from the um, Cossacks who you know, want to tear down this church and see the rib vaulting as being unorthodox. I think that is, you know, I'm never gonna find more than that in uh, a lot of the uh, primary sources. So you begin to see some distinctiveness. I think the period that um, I'm talking about, the late 16th century, early 17th century, there's a general shift in notions of identity. So I think that um, Nash, the ident identity of a nation is seen as the identity of the nobility. And I think what you see by the end of Mohila's time is the notion of identity becomes much broader among the Cossacks. It becomes more of what we think of as a national identity, an identity of the people. So there's also a shift as to who forms the nation? You know, so um, and the noble nation of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, you know, uh, could be of any religion and from any part of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. So I think um, Bistra said, I can't remember her exact words, but I really like the way she summed something up about what it is. What I find fascinating about Ukraine 
is exactly what we find fascinating about any other place in the world, right? And that is this constant negotiation and constant discourses and dialogues that often surprise you, right, uh, as to what is happening. I don't know if that answered your question, but I'm going to stop at that so that others can speak. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for your question, Daru. Um, I, I will try and be as concise as, as possible because, of course, it raises so many important and, and really interesting questions. Um, as far as terminology is concerned, I suppose a, a helpful place to start is what is the most common approach, as it were, to understanding this period of the 1920s and the 1930s which is, as I mentioned, this notion of the executive renaissance. Um, this notion was articulated and developed uh, in the 1950s in the, uh, by, by emigre scholars in the United States, and those scholars who uh, also, in a way, were affected by Soviet repressions. And so we need to take that context, as it were, on board. And on the one hand, like I said, this notion of the executed renaissance is uh, bitterly truthful because it does convey the tragedy of what happened in the 1920s and the, uh, especially in the 1930s to Ukrainian modernists. Uh, and uh, it does convey the very, uh, very real act of execution that happened at that time. It is not even a metaphor in this way. But at the same time, if we try to approach it, uh, seeking for elements that would really try and explain to us what was actually happening during that time, and what is really distinct about this art, then perhaps the executed Renaissance metaphor isn't that exhaustive, I could say. And, um, and uh, another element of it is that uh, Yuri Lavrinenko, which is the emigre scholar, he was the editor of the volume called The Executed Renaissance, uh, also established some kind of a canon, which was part of this anthology that he prepared of the modernist authors. Uh, so just to give you a bit of an idea what an important thing he did, some of the works that he included into this volume, they hadn't even been published, they were handwritten, or some of them, there wasn't even any access to them anymore because the books were just destroyed by the Soviets. So that anthology was of critical importance at the time when it came out in the 1950s. At the same time, it uh, simplif somewhat simpl simplifies uh, the, the very metaphor of the executed Renaissance and the canon established by Yuri Lavrinenko indeed simplifies the complex processes, overlapping processes that were happening in the 1920s and 30s. Among the main, main caveats that we should make about this notion uh, would be um, in the first place that among uh, all of the authors whom Yuri Lavrinenko includes in the volume, there is not a single woman author. That, of course, uh, does not uh, rhyme with the reality uh, and doesn't pay tribute to all of the uh, female artists during that time. And that is why I mentioned that the question of uh, the study of Ukrainian modernism is also, uh, to a great part, this question of uh, discovery, and in particular, discovery of women's art and women's literature. And uh, it is uh, a very important uh, parts of research and actually uh, in my mind it is a way a gateway into Ukrainian modernism from the perspective of general global modernist studies which is what I mentioned earlier in terms of Ukrainian modernism uh, sorely missing from this broader landscape of the study of, of modernism. Another problem with the notion of uh, the executed renaissance is this uh, idea of uh, um, well, Renaissance, of course, uh, uh, which is a, a questionable notion uh, in itself, even though in this particular case we can, as I, I try to show, refer back to the Baroque tradition. So in that sense, sense in the minds of the modernists, uh, modernist figures during this time, it was a, a Renaissance of a sort. But then there is, of course, this uh, also emphasis uh, on uh, the sense of victimhood and uh, on the uh, clear delineation, as it were, between the Ukrainian and the Soviet. And of course, as much as the Soviet heritage is such a difficult um, beast to deal with, as it were, these days, especially during the war times, 
Uh, it is also really important to be aware of the complex processes of overlapping relationship between, on the one hand, Ukrainization, and on the other hand, Sovietization that was happening at the same time. Uh, the notion that I propose for the specific period of the long 1920s, which is roughly between 1917 and let's say 1933, would be the notion of uh, Ukrainian Soviet modernism. Uh, so not Soviet Ukrainian modernism, which is the usual grammar way to, grammatic way to, to refer to it, but rather this notion of modernism that on the one hand, uh, inevitably was part of the nascent Soviet project to, uh, to which Ukrainian artists uh, definitely contributed. But at the same time, this perception from the point of view of the artists and the cultural figures themselves, that uh, Ukraine wasn't really at the margins of this big project of this cultural development, but rather was at the center, center of its own. So uh, that as far as this period is concerned. And just the final note in this respect, that of course, uh, this aspect of Ukrainian modernism uh, is a central part, we could say, a major part, definitely, but not all that there is to the story of Ukrainian modernism. Uh, the in the classic study by uh, Solomia Pavlichko, uh, the, uh, the range of modernism reaches back to the fond de siècle uh, modernism at the end of the 19th century and all the way up to the 1960s and 70s, where it was especially developed uh, beyond Ukraine, because of course within Ukraine, within Soviet Ukraine, there was no opportunity anymore to develop this modernism. And by the way, the reason this um, time frame is extended until many more de decades later, after the 1920s and 30s, uh, only confirms and reminds us about the importance and the unfinished project of modernism in the Ukrainian case. So of course, we know uh, about this metaphor and this concept of modernism or modernity in any case as an unfinished project in itself. But in the Ukrainian case, this notion of unfinished modernism it, uh, acquires a totally different additional meaning, which is that this uh, aspiration, this aesthetic aspiration, cultural aspiration to develop this art, this uh, urgency of innovation was abruptly stopped, annihilated, and that is why uh, this tradition, so modernism, Ukrainian modernism itself relies on this long-standing tradition of the Kievan art, uh, as we, we have seen in the case with Mikhail Burchuk, who was, by the way, uh, one of the first artists to refer back to this tradition, which is really important, and to rely on the, on the histor new historiography by the Ukrainian historian Mikhail Hrushevsky. Uh, and so uh, this, uh, 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 on the one hand, being steeped in this tradition uh, back to the Kievan Rus times and to the, Baroque, to the Baroque tradition, but at the same time, also the tradition that the artists in the 1990s and 2000s and nowadays, uh, they uh, perceive this time of 1920s and 30s as a matrix and tradition for themselves as well. So in that sense, it is also, uh, what we see now is the development and I wouldn't say completion, but definitely uh, a, a progress of this tradition happening um, in, uh, before our eyes. Thank you very much. So now it's probably my turn. So yeah, thank you, Daria, so much for your wonderful questions. And uh, first of all, I wanted to make a remark re regarding the Soviet legacy. Of course, there are only so many ways how we can speak about <laughs> Ukrainian art of the three decades in the 20 minutes. So I didn't have an opportunity to speak about the whole range of projects because this uh, actually the, the relations with uh, of uh, contemporary Ukrainian art with uh, Soviet um, legacy are much more complicated than it might have seemed uh, from, from my uh, speech, because uh, for the first generation, which uh, emerged uh, during and after the collapse of the Soviet Union, of course, this escape from this uh, um, overly ideological landscape of the late, uh, and especially of this shallow slogans uh, of the, uh, which were already like uh, absolutely not uh, um, relevant to the, to the people of, of the late Soviet Union was a very important process. So they, 
they are a political uh, even sometimes position I, I didn't mention here like the painters it's there was a huge school of uh, trans avant-garde painting sometimes their a political uh, uh, position was uh, the sign of the um how to say the, the desire to break up with this uh, soviet ideological space there were a lot of artists uh, who were exploring the, the newly emerging art national identity and then after 2004 and especially in two, after 2010 and there was a huge interest towards soviet modernism especially especially the soviet modernism of 1960s because in 1960s the uh, ukrainian artists in spite of the whole this ideological pressures due to this uh, um, um, relatively better climate in the in the cultural field were able to rediscover both boychuk and other modernists and created a huge school of uh, late soviet modernism rethinking and revising this uh, this uh, early modernism modernist artworks and for the um, artists who worked into after 2010 it becomes particularly relevant and impo important especially after uh, the so-called decommunization started in Ukraine uh, in 2015 uh, if I'm not mistaken it was especially especially important because uh, uh, the artistic community faced the question: What should we do with all this uh, all these monuments, all these mosaics, all these artworks that uh, uh, that our government suddenly wanted just to 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 I don't know to to uh, get rid of them? Now, of course, uh, there comes a time to revise even the criticism of the communization in the artistic community uh, back then in 2015, because now we are looking at all the this situation was a completely new eye because we understand the the wider picture of uh, all this uh, influence of uh, communist narratives and even the interest towards Soviet problematics in uh, uh, Eastern European art of uh, after 2010 and uh, 14. So regarding the significance of the Maidan uh, of uh, independence, uh, you know, it's a very complicated question. I used it mainly a, more like a poetic metaphor because I needed something to link all three parts of my uh, speech and of course like this Maidan becomes the main hero and it's like it's a, it's more about symbolic uh, geography because uh, indeed uh, for uh, the last three decades uh, this um, this Maidan of independence the central square of Kiev becomes particularly significant. I don't know why, but whatever, whenever something bad or good happens, people just go there and uh, either protest or celebrate. And this is like, and even artists, like if we're speaking about the new Ukrainian art after the collapse of the Soviet Union, so there was this uh, very powerful squatting movement, like when uh, artists were uh, creating uh, independent squats and in abandoned buildings, and all those squats were uh, uh, situated on the radial streets uh, near Maidan. So I don't know why it's like, it's an interesting question. I, I don't have an answer to it, to be honest. Maybe maybe there is something special in that place. So uh, if we speak about the movement to the museum, it's also an extremely interesting question because it, uh, it poses the question from which museum and to which museum? Because when we are speaking about the end of the Soviet era, we are speaking about the escape from the Soviet uh, institutional space and the, from the same system of Soviet art Art, which was a completely different uh, uh, from uh, what we see now and of course uh, by the time of uh, like 1991 it was already uh, in decay and uh, artists wanted uh, some new spaces and they wanted to conquer new media new options new territories physically and symbolically as well so after that, we have to keep it in mind that no um, real museum of contemporary art emerged in Ukraine uh, in the years of independence. So uh, what was the museums that we have now are either those classical museums that we have still since like a uh, 19th century and that uh, which collections of which uh, basically stopped after the collapse of the Soviet Union, or these are private small in institutions uh, such as, for instance, a Museum of Contemporary Art in Odessa, which is not a gigantic institution in the Western uh, understanding of the word. So uh, the artists uh, were basically not moving to the museum. They were looking for a museum to move to, but uh, not always finding where to move. For many artists, this lack of institutions was a very big, uh, was a very big issue. That's why for some, for, for generations of Ukrainian artists, like for instance, Western institutions become uh, the uh, 
um, the space where they can uh, exhibit and where they receive, where they can understand what they're doing more. Because in Ukraine, the new system of art institution uh, emerged probably in late, uh, maybe after 2006, seven, when Pinchuk Art Center, Mestetsky Arsenal, big arts uh, museums uh, changed a little bit their policy and some new institutions emerged and new galleries emerged. But up till now, we are facing the situation where there is no such thing as a museum of contemporary art in Ukraine. So there is a, a huge gap in uh, the museum collections and uh, Ukrainian contemporary art uh, still exists as this apocryph apocryph, uh, which, has uh, sometimes no material evidence due to the uh, circumstances of the development of contemporary art in Ukraine in the last uh, several decades. But as I uh, as I discovered, for instance, uh, during a recent uh, seminar with our con colleagues from Lithuania, this lack of museification is not only a Ukrainian problem. It's like a general uh, disease of uh, many post-Soviet uh, spaces, which definitely deserves to be studied as a separate uh, research. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, so should I just present my question for Alenka and then she'll answer? Okay. Uh, so uh, first of all, thank you all for um, your thought-provoking talks uh, that span across centuries revealing the wealth and beauty and complexity of Ukrainian art. Uh, for the sake of time, I will jump right uh, into my question. So Olenka, in some of your other works, you discuss how imperially supported 19th century Slavophile and pan-Slavic movements, quote unquote, rediscovered uh, Kiev and Rus churches and cathedrals and used them to propagate the idea of the all Russian Orthodox style. Um, Russian imperial scholars and artists studied, restored uh, and reconstructed some of those uh, sites like the St. Sophia Cathedral and St. Cyril's Church by taking into, into account solely its medieval appearance and completely ignoring all later 17th century Ukrainian additions and changes. Um, so can you tell us a bit more about the 19th century and the subsequent um, communist uh, 20th century history of the Church of the Savior of the Verstova um, Hill? Uh, and towards the end of your talk, you mentioned that uh, there was practically nothing and the church was, um, uh, as far as I understood, uh, kind of recognized only as the mid 12th century burial site of the Prince uh, Yuri Dolgoruki, the founder of Moscow. Uh, but that seems to be an important site for the Russian imperial, from the Russian imperial perspective. So why then was this charge um, ignored and was it? And also, can you speak a bit about the significance of this charge to today's Ukraine and the Ukraine Orthodox Church? Thank you. Okay. So um, my first uh, answer isn't going to be very nice or polite to anyone, but anyone who is Ukrainian should know this church. Uh, it is that important. And very few people know this church. And uh, these questions that you're asking me prove exactly my point, right? This is one of the few medieval monuments to survive in Ukraine. We only have like a handful of these monuments. So basically I would say that any Ukrainian child who goes to school, especially in the city of Kiev, should know this monument and its history, but very few people know this monument and this history. Secondly, uh, this church has been closed for a very long time because of the fight between the Moscow Patriarchate and the museums and the Kiev Patriarchate, right? So it beca has become an embattled site. So part of uh, dealing with the embattlement has been the constant restoration of this church by the Lavra Museum, okay? It has now been restored with the help of Italians and um, I have not seen the restoration, but the restoration still focused on the cave in the Rus period because it has been so ingrained in Ukrainian history through the 19th century and through um, the Soviet period that everything that is cave in Rus is great. And, you know, we need to look at everything from cave in Rus, which don't get me wrong, that's my area of expertise. So, you know, I have nothing against Kiev and Rus, but the point is that this structure 
is not important to Ukrainian history because of what survives in it from the Kiev and Rus period, but because of what survives in it from the early modern period. So yet no publication exists on the frescoes that I've shown you. Now there are people in the Lavra who have published a, a sort of general history and photographs of this church. The photographs that you'll find in, um, in Soviet publications are the discovery of a single 12th century fresco, which required the removal of the um, early modern uh, images to expose it. And then during the Soviet period, that awful looking sarcophagus thing was put in there to mark the grave of Yuri Dolgoruki. And I don't actually know that anyone has ever found Yuri Dolgoruki, but if you know anything about archeological practices uh, and Soviet archeological practices, whoever they dug up in that church would have been identified as Yuri Dolgoruki, right? So um, the point is the church is important in the middle ages. It is important because it was the prin a princely church on the outskirts of Kiev. Uh, it didn't um, really survive. Uh, one wall was standing. So if you, I know I uh, messed up with the slides, but you could see the outline of the Byzantine structure and then the structure that Mohila rebuilt. So the Byzantine structure, only the foundations, or I should say the Rus structure, only the foundations, uh, survive, right? And then you have uh, the renovation of this church. Uh, I, th uh, I think Mohila, one of the reasons he renovated this church is because he was also the uh, Ihuman uh, or the uh, arch, whatever it is, I can't remember, the head of the Lavra Monastery, the Archimandrite of the Lavra Monastery. And this is right by uh, the Lavra, right? It's two steps from the Ekonomichni Borota into the Lavra. And uh, I think the reason why these images have been ignored is because they talk about an independent uh, patriarchate in Kiev and Mohila as someone who was, in, in fact, had an identity of Sarmatianism and Ruthenian identity in the context of Ukrainian lands and who was negotiating or willing to negotiate with the papacy about the union of the church. So if you know anything more about Mohila, he is also the author of the first um, statement of faith in the Orthodox church, right? And he is a saint in the Russian Orthodox uh, church. So I think there are certain aspects of Mohila that needed to be repressed, um, if that. So basically, um, I think this, in a way, the question you've asked touches exactly um, why this series is important. Because even Ukrainians, most Ukrainians, don't know the importance of this church, right? Have never been in this church. And it is one of three or four medieval churches in Kiev. I don't know if I've answered the question again, but thank you for the question. Um, thank you. Uh, should I proceed? Go ahead. Yeah. And in the meantime, yes, you, you can proceed, but uh, maybe it's interesting also to to uh, uh, to remark that uh, Lilia, you come near Kiev, right? You 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 sent from there, right? Or I left Kiev when I was two. Okay, good. So you couldn't see it. Good. Thank you. Sorry, it wouldn't have been anyone's fault because the church has been closed. For yeah, like yeah, this is clear. Uh, this is clear. I only wanted to make the point that uh, you make a strong point. So, so your yeah. answer uh, is, uh, so and the question was so important also uh, kind of ask from someone born in Kiev. Right, uh, yeah. Um, so thank you so much. Um, so my questions to Bohdan, um, I would actually uh, would like to return to this um, lack of female artists and return to your own question that you posed in one of your notes in the longer essay. 
um, that you've written on the subject. Uh, so why do you think this uneven representation of the Ukrainian modernism as a solely kind of male um, space happened in the first place? Uh, and in particularly, uh, it seems strange given the importance of such Ukrainian modernist writers as Lesya Ukrainka and Olha Kobylanska. Uh, and so on a different note, you discussed a great variety of artists, directors, and writers working at the same time in different media. Uh, but could you also talk a bit about the importance of the artistic group uh, to Ukrainian modernism? Were groups and artistic collectives as common in um, the Ukrainian modernism as they were elsewhere? And along the same lines, you started your talk with the painting by Vasil Cetlar, uh, but can you speak about actual relationships between Ukrainian visual artists, writers, and directors? Uh, were uh, these artists responding to each other's work? And most importantly, how? Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Lilia, uh, for this uh, very helpful and great question, questions rather. Um, in terms of the presence of uh, female artists and uh, cultural figures more generally in the 1920s and 30s, this is a truly, truly um, fascinating issue because whenever we look uh, at the photos from, from the time, and uh, at the photos of the groups of writers uh, uh, that uh, were established at that time, because uh, of course, especially, well, it was uh, uh, quite popular during that time more generally, but especially in the Soviet Union, this sense of belonging to a group. So when, when you look to your, all the different groups that represented different kinds of aspects of uh, art and culture, uh, be it uh, more towards uh, peasant culture or more towards more elite, highbrow culture, as it were. Uh, when you look at these photos, you can hardly see any women there, in, even in the, in, in the photos left from that time. And so I was all, uh, always uh, really um, intrigued and puzzled by why is it the case? Uh, and there is definitely, definitely more research needs to be done on that. And if there is anyone in our audience who is wondering which topic to choose to do uh, research on in terms of Ukrainian arts and Ukrainian arts of the modernist period, I would really, really uh, invite you to, to, to choose this one. Uh, from my understanding, uh, the, one of the reasons why that was the case is because, uh, of course, the Soviet system was a, a, a fundamentally patriarchal system. Uh, there was a difference between what was declared and what was happening in, in the actual reality. So, uh, of course, uh, prima facie on, on page, uh, lip service was paid to the equality of men and women, to the, uh, to, to the emancipation of women. But at the same time, uh, in practice, there was far from the actual reality. And in fact, uh, when we look, for example, uh, specifically at uh, literature, for instance, uh, in that case, there was a, a special genre, as it were, women's writing. So uh, women were uh, kind of liberated, but only to a certain extent, and only within very limited confines. And those confines were uh, regarding women writing about women's topics, whatever they were, in the, in the perception of, uh, uh, of the... Uh, uh, actors of the literary process, as it were. And those topics mostly had to do with some sentimentality related uh, to family, for example, or children. So those uh, really uh, classic patriarchal, as it were, uh, shibboleths and uh, classic patriarchal uh, restrictions uh, for women. And so they were pushed into this uh, very narrow direction. But uh, at the same time, I should say that even with it that, uh, within that uh, direction, there was quite a lot of uh, subversion happening and quite a lot of really, really uh, fascinating kind of writing happening as well. And I should also say that just a few years ago, uh, actually a couple of years ago, the very first anthology of women's writing from the 1920s was published. So this is such a totally uh, fresh, undiscovered topic. Uh, and uh, it's, uh, it's uh, as far as I know so far, it's only in Ukrainian, but I really hope it's going to be translated into other languages as well. But so even within those works and this anthology, 
it is in the first place extremely interesting to see how the uh, this uh, feminist um, uh, sentiment and feminist urgency makes its way into these writings as well. Um, and interestingly uh, enough as well, there is this sense of tradition too. So uh, what, uh, Lydia, you mentioned earlier about this really shocking and jarring contrast between indeed uh, these really powerful female figures who uh, not were just really important to the development of Ukrainian modernism. They were the pioneering uh, modernist writers Indeed, Lesya Ukrainka and Olga Kobolanska, Kobolanska, they were the mothers of modernism in the Ukrainian case. And interestingly, in the 1920s, there was even an attempt to uh, publish an almanac uh, of uh, women's writing, which was specifically dedicated to Olga Kobolanska. So even by women's uh, uh, artists, there was this sense of continuity uh, from, uh, from uh, uh, that tradition. Another aspect of why uh, we know so little about uh, uh, this uh, amazing women's uh, uh, artists and, and, and writers from the time uh, has to do uh, actually with the uh, canon that I partially referred to earlier, established by Lavrinenko, um, and also with this difference between, um, shall we say, nationally aware writing and proletarian writing. So, uh, in general, even nowadays in, in, in scholarship on this period, uh, there is this, uh, how should I put it, uh, reservations or caution about uh, broaching specifically uh, writing, which could be in one way or another called proletarian, that is written by authors uh, who were not necessarily propagating uh, really or, or trying or cultivating really highbrow literature, uh, but where, uh, exercising a different kind of writing. And so that's one of the reasons why uh, those writers who were really aware of this elite function of literature, uh, let's say Mokola Khvilubi, especially Mokola Zaro, uh, they are much, much better known th than other writers uh, who were uh, more, uh, who by, by some scholars are perceived as these proletarian writers, whatever that means. Of course, we should make some reservations about this notion too. So I think this social element, the element of social background has got a very uh, important role to play. And in general, I think there is, uh, we, we need, that, that there is a much greater need uh, in discovering uh, female voices um, uh, in general in Ukrainian literature. Um, I feel like there is such a great, uh, and I know that there is such a great uh, treasury of those voices that really waits and screams to be discovered. And uh, I think it, it's reflective of the bigger, uh, of the bigger problem um, as well. And that's, of course, part of the more global problem of uh, how few uh, modernist female voices behind the general canon are known and the question of canon. Because, of course, the modernist canon, uh, uh, apart from Virginia Woolf and a couple of other female names, is uh, overwhelmingly male-centered and male-orientated. Uh, which doesn't reflect the, the actual reality uh, of the period and of this artistic movement. And uh, I'm aware of, of the time, uh, so I'm just going to try and uh, give very quick answers to the other two questions. As far as artistic groups are concerned, uh, definitely, like I mentioned, it was almost a fashion, as it were, during the Soviet times to form these groups, uh, for these groups to uh, try and uh, support uh, different ideas uh, and uh, for, for these ideas to almost be in conflict between the different groups. And very sadly, this literary competition, this cultural competition, very quickly turned into political, uh, blatant political rivalry, whereby there would be some organizations that would be much more loyal to the regime and that the regime would support more and they would start writing not as much critical articles uh, about those authors who wouldn't agree necessarily with this nascent socialist realist uh, canon. Uh, uh, so this preference was given to these uh, more loyal uh, groups and these articles would no longer be uh, critical in this sense of literary criticism. They would be more like pieces that would then be used by the courts uh, than to uh, deliver this uh, verdict of execution towards these writers. 
so uh, as far as these groups are concerned, uh, I, I mentioned already uh, the Portuguese artists. Uh, but uh, uh, and by the way, I should say that with, uh, within uh, the Portuguese group, uh, there were uh, many women's uh, artists, women artists uh, uh, as well. Who, by the way, uh, when we read memoirs from that time, it also becomes very clear from what a poor background they uh, they were coming or underprivileged background, and even within their families, they were really discouraged from pursuing it. They were more encouraged to do uh, some uh, activities that are related to traditional uh, women's jobs and something around art, but not art per se. So even by their own families, they, they weren't encouraged. But even when they were trying to join, actually, for example, this Portuguese group, uh, there wasn't necessarily this uh, uh, immediate, as it were, enthusiasm to just accept them as, as equals. So they really needed to fight their way through even within those groups. And, and there, were, there was a great number of other movements and directions in terms of avant-garde, cubists, futurist um, art as well. Uh, so in this sense, uh, Ukrainian uh, modernism, even though it was really accelerated and condensed uh, because of this short period, short-lived period where the artists uh, actually had a relative at least freedom to experiment and create this uh, innovative art, all sorts of isms, uh, were pursued and experimented with uh, by Ukrainian artists. And in that sense, even though Ukrainian modernism is definitely very distinct in its hybridity, it also was uh, to a large extent uh, on a par and in parallel and in synchronicity with the general uh, tendencies and movements within the more general European modern uh, landscape. And that is why it is all the more shocking that Ukrainian modernist art is not included into this bigger discussion of global modernism. Um, yeah, I think that I'm, I'm going to leave it there because we are running out of time and I want to leave more time for my colleagues as well. Uh, thank you so much for your question. Thank you so much. Um, I'll be uh, very brief. Uh, so, um, uh, Alisa, uh, again, returning back to the question of Maidan, so some critics and artists, including uh, Sergei Loznitsa, who was here uh, at our previous event, described the uh, Maidan revolution as a total work of art. Uh, so, would you agree with this statement? Uh, and if so, how would you describe the relationship between actions done by individual artists or artistic groups and Maidan's artistic totality? And my second question uh, off of Daria's questions about these artists' um, entrance to galleries and probably based on your uh, answer, lack of mu museification, as you put it very nicely. Um, how did uh, this com very strange com the combination affected these artists' careers? And what is and if uh, there is an artistic response to the war by the artists you were talking about? Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, it's a very interesting question about the total work of art because I want to remind those who are not aware of it that this uh, total installation is a term that was uh, invented by a uh, late Soviet artist, uh, an official artist, Ilya Kabakov, who got uh, extremely popular after the collapse of the Soviet Union and now is one of, and was born, by the way, in Dnipro or Dnipropetrovsk, as it was previously. Uh, uh, called uh, in Ukraine, but uh, in the age of 16 left uh, Ukraine uh, to study in uh, the art school in Moscow. So this total installation has uh, like roots. And uh, yes, indeed, when we had uh, this uh, protest on Maidan, a lot of people mentioned that it looked like an art installation. And yeah, of course, we were like, uh, we, we were using this, uh, this uh, word total, total installation, because it really, it really looked like some artistic environment and created, uh, created not only for the purpose of uh, politics, but also, or protest, but also for some aesthetic uh, weird, uh, weird uh, reasons, because the ice barricades, these uh, um, pop-up uh, art installations, like which had political background, like for instance, this um, Christmas tree, which was called Yolka, uh, which became this uh, huge installation in the center of Maidan and one of the centers of the, of the, of the protests 
and the aesthetics of these barricades. Of course, the, you when you, when you enter that space, especially taking in consideration that uh, all people were using, and it's very interesting how time flows in this. Um, how to say altered states of political consciousness because it's a completely different space where this completely different logic and completely different behavior uh, uh, takes place. For instance, people are using carnivalesque dresses. They were like, uh, and it was a very interesting to analyze how they were using different dresses. For instance, uh, uh, people of older generations were adhering to this old Cossack aesthetics, uh, which go back to Rep. And I even wrote an article how uh, Repin's uh, art Work, Ilya Repin's artwork, Cossacks are writing a letter to a Turkish Sultan, influenced uh, accidentally even the protests on Maidan because we saw just like I, 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 I was mind blown because it just like as if as if they came from that painting. So, uh, but the younger generation, for instance, was using the steampunk aesthetics, computer game aesthetics, like a, a completely different situation. So yeah, when you entered that space, you had the feeling that it was some weird carnivalesque uh, uh, atmosphere. And, uh, but re and recently there was one more return of uh, total installation into my at least word. It's not that I'm thinking about total installations all the time, but uh, uh, in Kharkiv, uh, in, um, the first uh, weeks of uh, this war, uh, a group of artists was hiding in the basement of uh, this um, 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 Yermilov Center, which is one of the main galleries in Kharkiv. And uh, because it's in the basement of the University of Kazarin in Kharkiv, it, it seemed like a very safe location. And for two weeks, uh, people uh, people uh, lived there, uh, had some strange like uh, uh, life uh, on but but surprise. Uh, by weird irony of life, uh, this was the place which was bombed the most in Kharkiv because it's in the center of the city. And after uh, after people evacuated from this uh, Yermilov center, the artists created this uh, pop up archive of their uh, of their experiences and called this in the text. The curator said that this was not life. This was just art. This is the documentation of artistic performance, and this is the, this is just total installation. Uh, for me, I felt this um, completely different approach to the idea of total installation because which was something that was totally aesthetic in uh, Maidan and in 2014. Uh, this, uh, this reference to total installation became the, the idea of escapism, the idea to escape the pressure of this uh, political moment and to try to dissociate, you know, the psychological mechanism of dissociation. This is not with me, this is it's not I, me, it's something else. But I was recently warned by um, the editor-in-chief of a magazine, Text Turkunst, a German uh, very good magazine, uh, who told me that I have to be very careful using this uh, idea of total installation and applying it to reality because apparently a lot of right-wing, uh, how to say it, ideologists and uh, uh, writers also are using it in order to somehow devalue uh, the um, what is happening in, uh, in 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 the country and just to pretend uh, to aestheticize the, the the violence and this uh, over aestheticization and over like too, too 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 close connections between like violence and idea of total installation can be can be dangerous i am not fully uh, uh how to say it, convinced but i'm just warning is that such an opinion exists in this universe so uh regarding the museums and um how this whole situation functions. There are a lot of collections. There are a lot of private collections. There are a lot of uh, small institutional collections. Some artists uh, were donating artworks to certain collections, especially there was this very important trend in uh, the last five years when artists um, became like famous artists themselves became either directors or curators of big Ukrainian museums. For instance, my late friend, Alexander Roitberg, uh, whom I already mentioned today, uh, who died last year uh, from Corona, uh, was uh, a director of Odessa Fine Art Museum. And uh, with his efforts, this absolutely backwards and conservative art institution suddenly became one of the most prominent and dynamic Ukrainian museums. And uh, due to his personal connection with uh, all the artists, he was able to do something that our Ukrainian uh, state wasn't able to do for decades, to actually uh, bring the artworks to the museum, just like some 
some artists gave it for free some sometimes he would find some small uh, honorarium for for to 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 thank them and so on and uh, just before the war another important initiative of this kind appeared uh, because another artist Mikola Babak um, created surprisingly without even telling anyone in the in one year he created a collection of I think more than 250 to 250 artworks uh, and it's still growing uh, and uh, he made it for the Cherkasse Museum can you believe it so the museum in Cherkasse today will have the best uh, collection of contemporary art ever just because of this effort of one particular person who approached each person person and said you have to give this uh, artwork to the museum because otherwise there will be no history it will be just all oral you know uh, legends and we uh, we are now facing the situation when we are sometimes having troubles creating like when I make exhibitions dedicated to 1990s and late 1980s there are so many works that I know from there, there are even sometimes photographs but I have no idea where those works are and it's a huge tragedy and badly needs to be changed and there are a lot of initiatives in Ukraine uh, uh, that call for the creation at least for, for of some kind of a museum collection but there is there are plenty of very interesting questions what kind of collection should it be in the 21st century in the situation when a lot of actual artworks uh, are already gone. Uh, so it's an interesting topic, especially said in the current context, because we understand that a lot of artworks can be uh, destroyed and the, um, the destroy destruction of cultural monuments, artworks, collections, and uh, museum, uh, museums in this current war is one of the most important topics because uh, it's like it's, uh, it's extremely important now to, to, to evacuate uh, uh, collections. A lot of museums have done it, but a lot of museums did not do anything. And a lot of uh, artworks are already uh, now, uh, now situated on the territories which are temporarily, hopefully, occupied by the Russian troops and these are huge problems. And the, some museums were bombed, this Archip Kuinji Museum in Mariupol. So today the topic of a museum is even more sad than it used to be before this war. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, um, yeah. I would like to 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 uh, so so ask you so so the speakers maybe also to re respond to each other talks or maybe you have questions you know one to the other, uh, and I would I also like to um, uh, to uh, maybe at the end also to come uh, to kind of questions what we can do what uh, first of all I mean what you all. Uh, very beautifully have shown that the tendency to 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 write in broad uh, broad strokes or so to present art in broad uh, broad strokes uh, so to speak or so in the museum is always in danger to uh, to become complicit uh, with an oppressive power political power and so how could we so 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 I represent this very much nuanced and uh, historically informed uh, uh, so context that is, uh, seems to be so needed to see uh, uh, the cultural difference and also uh, to e uh, evaluate uh, underrepresented art. So, so, so this is one question. So, so, so maybe you can also respond uh, to each other um, first. Um, but I want also to, to, to I mean, uh, there's this question that uh, many of you have also kind of touched on is the question of reconstruction. And I spoke also with a colleague uh, from the School of Architecture. I was saying, well, we have to think about reconstruction more than building <laughs> new buildings but kind of how to uh, say so how uh, so, so to integrate the whole ecological discourse into um into uh the new uh, uh you know uh, uh uh so so new challenges uh we have so so uh what could we so 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 what what is there to be done you know what is uh, should archives be so, so how should archives be be protected built uh so how could we uh, could we uh, uh, appreciate and also kind of uh, 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 show solidarity with the Ukrainian culture from our side? So, so, so maybe you can uh, first of all respond to each other's paper if maybe you have questions. Uh, so, so you never have spoken to each other, um, but I think there was. Uh, uh, so, so you were very much in sync uh, with the general message, and um, maybe this is the first invitation. And the second is that we maybe brainstorm about the possibilities 
what can be done and how can, or, can also institutions uh, like ours uh, help uh, in this respect? So I don't know who wants to respond to, to which uh, paper, but I think uh, it, it was uh, so, so uh, it worked so well uh, uh, together. Alenka, maybe. <laughs> Um, I would like to thank both of uh, my co-speakers for their papers, and um, I didn't know uh, Bohdan was working on the visual arts, so it's uh, wonderful to see his work extend in uh, that direction, um, and uh, to know, I think there is a lot to be done on Ukrainian uh, modernism, but I would also like to say of all the periods of Ukrainian art, Ukrainian modernism has actually received more attention than any other period of Ukrainian art. And I think partially that is also because a lot of the individuals that Bodan uh, mentioned, so not Bulchuk, of course, but people like Malevich and Tatlin have been um, ascribed to Russian modernism, which has uh, um, received quite a lot of attention. So I think there is a huge discourse there that um, needs to be had. And I think it's a great topic, as uh, Bodan said, because of um, the way there are overlaps with Soviet identity, with modernist identity, with uh, national identities. So a very rich uh, topic and um, many works that are unknown. And uh, I would like to thank Elisa for her paper, because I think contemporary Ukrainian art and everything from the 1990s is so incredibly exciting. And um, there's so much of it. And again, I think one of the th things that Elisa is pointing out is, again, there's a lot of empirical work that needs to be done, right? So um, I was just jotting down some names of artists I didn't know. So I think, um, that uh, period to me is fascinating of the way the carnivalesque period and the way it ties in with literature. For example, like as you were speaking, I kept thinking of Andruhovich over and over again. Um, so, you know, when you talk about the carnival and carnivalesque. Um, so thank you both. I've learned a lot. I would like to thank uh, everyone who's worked on organizing this panel because I think that is the answer to your question. Uh, I think one of the things that we can do is organize more and more of such panels that bring together different speakers who work on uh, art, on museums, on um, the connection between literature and art in Ukraine. Um, I think that is one of the things we can do. I think it's hard to answer about what we can do for museums in Ukraine. Uh, I've been thinking about that and talking to people in various institutions. Um, you know, we could try to help to send some packing material, but again, no one can control the Russian missiles, right? So what we need to do is end this war. That is, uh, and I think that is also part of the problem with dealing with Ukrainian culture is that there has always been uh, in these past 30 years, some kind of extreme situation that would always get the, the funding first or have to be dealt with before uh, cultural institutions. What I'm hoping is that this war will bring attention to um, what can be learned from Ukraine and maybe then people in the West will invest more in um, these studies. And as I said, and as uh, Bistra um, highlighted, decolonization, decolonization, decolonization. Uh, I myself teach in an introduction to Russian culture um, class in Cambridge, which I will never teach in again, because I have been presenting uh, Kiev and Ruiz materials under an introduction to Russian culture class that goes on through the Soviet period. And in the Soviet period, even when they talk about artists from Kharkiv or Kiev, they don't even acknowledge the existence of a Ukrainian so uh, socialist state. Uh, decolonization. 
I don't know why we don't have it in East Slavic studies and everyone else has already moved way ahead of us. Thank you very much. Uh, Bhutan? Do you want to, uh, Bhutan, do you want to, to respond to, to uh, uh, the well, two speakers and uh, maybe also uh, have some suggestions how, so, so what can be done? So, so, so very, very much also in a pragmatic sense. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Dean Inkler, for giving us a chance to, to reflect on these uh, very urgent questions, in fact. Uh, there are many thoughts that I have. I'm going to try and summarize them as concisely as I can. Um, on the one hand, I'm, just, I'm going to start with your second question, actually, in terms of the practical actions that could be undertaken. So I, I could totally subscribe to what Olenka has just said, that uh, uh, a really important way to... Uh, preserve this cultural heritage is to end the war and a really uh, important way to end the war is uh, just this realization that there is this need for um, even though that doesn't sound necessarily so related with with culture but there is real need in Ukraine for uh, very practical mil military help these days and those things in fact are interrelated because I think that the attack the uh, the 500 kilogram or perhaps a thousand kilogram bomb dropped on the Mariupol drama theater is just the absolute epitome of the hell that is happening and the uh, stance that is taken towards Ukrainian cultural her heritage. That is the absolute symbol that uh, really encapsulates the the uh, what is at stake, the danger, and uh, what needs to happen. There needs to be a way for the Ukrainian army to protect these places, to fight back. And uh, so if there is, uh, if uh, our audience could support the Ukrainian army in this way or push for um, uh, military support from, from uh, the countries that you're from, I think that that's an extremely, extremely important thing to happen. And it, even though it is not necessarily the most, uh, you know, cultural thing to mention, but culture really depends on this. Uh, another thing very practical is that I've been a part of this group uh, organized by the um, German Association of Art Historians. And what they do is that they have these weekly sessions with uh, uh, museums in Ukraine. And really museums in Ukraine are the institutions and the people that are the people who know the best what needs to happen. And it starts with very, very practical issues uh, like uh, some museums just not even having boxes where to put the, the boxes of the right kind to put the artworks in. Uh, then the question of restoration as well, in terms of paints and many, many other questions related to it. The question of transportation, because there are certain uh, works of art that are, for example, really, uh, uh, they have, have very big size and there needs to be a very specific kind of transport that can transport that. And then there is this additional question that some museums decide uh, not to evacuate uh, uh, their pieces of art. So what can be done uh, if they're not uh, taken out of these places? Uh, how could that be helped? And of course, uh, there are so many museums all over Ukraine where, for instance, uh, people do not necessarily speak foreign languages, you know? And uh, it is really important to reach out to these places and to uh, see what museums really need this help because uh, not necessarily those museums that can speak about it are the only ones that really need this help. Oftentimes, it's it's actually the other way around. Those who cannot speak about it need they, that help the most. Apart from them, apart from that, uh, you know, there have been uh, there have hardly been any exhibitions on Ukrainian modernism. Uh, in, uh, for example, as an example, Olenka is definitely right that out of all these periods. Uh, art periods, uh, uh, modernist periods, uh, has arguably been best researched, but that best researched uh, is still very, very badly under-researched, which gives you an idea about how well the other uh, topics are researched. And so what, what I mean by that is uh, we really need exhibitions in London, we really need exhibitions uh, in New York, we really need exhibitions, exhibitions in Paris, where Ukrainian artworks are included not just as a couple of pieces among uh, the Russian avant-garde, as it were, 
why Ukrainian artworks, like it was, for example, uh, at uh, in London, at the Royal Exhibition uh, dedicated to the 19th, to the uh, centenary of the 1917 revolution, where artists like Dovzhanko and like uh, Kazimir Malevich and Klement Trajko were all uh, included into this broad, uh, uh, undifferentiated umbrella of uh, the Russian avant-garde. So there needs to be uh, uh, Ukrainian art deserves and uh, should uh, have its own voice so that there would be this understanding that this art exists and what uh, kind of art uh, it is. And perhaps this is a bit too much of a statement to make, but I think that if uh, the topics that we have spoken about would have been known better, and if there would have been already exhibitions for decades of this art, this war would have had much, much less chance of happening. I'm, I'm deeply convinced of that because at the moment, even in those countries, for example, in Germany, where I'm based, those people who support Ukraine in this war, they, they still oftentimes, for instance, do not are surprised to learn that the Ukrainian language is not a separate language, uh, uh, that they thought that it's a dialect of Russian. So, uh, you know, for example, me reading an article on COVID doesn't make me a doctor. Uh, a doctor. Uh, I do not have the background that I need, uh, even though I can read a, a cleverly written article on BBC. So, of course, uh, creating this uh, background uh, or not creating, but rather uh, creating the platforms for discovering this background is extremely uh, crucial to understand the bigger context. And this is the final probably point I will make in this respect, uh, which is the point that I started with, that uh, it's extremely important to emphasize that, well, Ukraine makes, it, makes the headlines whenever some kind of crisis happened. Whether it, when it uh, was the Euromaidan or the annexation of Crimea, or uh, the, uh, the start of the war back in 2014, or now this unspeakable war happening uh, right now uh, and, and taking people's lives right now. Uh, Ukrainian war, our uh, event uh, has shown today, and that, that is why I'm so grateful to the organizers of this event, is that Ukrainian history and culture and art uh, needs to be uh, dated back to 901 uh, uh, rather than 1991, you know, when, the, uh, when Ukraine gained independence. I mean, 901 is obviously a metaphor. It can go even uh, earlier than that, given the emergence of the Kievan Rus. Uh, so that would be uh, the main ideas that I would have in terms of what could be done based on really practical things that urgently need to happen, urgent, real practical help, and in terms of the conceptual and sustainable and strategic uh, development of Ukrainian studies and of uh, inclusion of these or those topics into the broader discussions, be it of medieval times, of the discussions of uh, Kievan Rus, or uh, the modernist period, or the contemporary art. Uh, they really need to be included into those broader discussions. And just as the very final thing, I just wanted to say a huge thank you to uh, our, uh, my co-speakers tonight. I have certainly learned a lot uh, and I'm very, especially very grateful for very detailed discussion. I uh, must confess, I haven't been uh, to the church uh, that Olanka has uh, 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 spoken about in such uh, amazing detail. And I, I just really look forward to the time where it will be possible to come back to Ukraine. And I really pray for that church to still be there, to go there. And I'm very grateful to Alisa, not just for the talk tonight, but also for Alisa's uh, research that I have been really grateful for in terms of the contemporary art that is being created during this war. Alisa has published uh, uh, widely on it, and uh, I've been reading enthusiastically all these pieces. And I have certainly learned a lot about this whole process uh, of uh, the development of Ukrainian art in the 90s. So I, uh, I have words of gratitude for that. Thank you very much, Bodan. Uh, Alisa, yes, <laughs> last. Thanks. Uh, thanks, yeah. Uh, actually, I also wanted to thank uh, everybody uh, who organized this um, seminar today, and of course, uh, my co-speakers. Uh, and uh, yeah, uh, regarding the church, 
<laughs> which is the one of the main heroes today. So I, uh, for many years, I was a deputy director of Lavra Gallery, which is just next door to this uh, church. And then I was a deputy director of Mastetsky Arsenal and curators there for many years. And uh, so my, half of my life basically was uh, rotating around this place. And I must first of all say that for many years, this church was just closed. There was not so much, uh, uh, you know, that you could do because uh, it was like some endless renovation from God knows what to God knows what. I don't even know if they finished that renovation and what they were doing there because it was just like I was trying to 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 get there for many years. So I know visually how it looks from outside, but I must confess I've never been there as well, and it's it's a shame. Maybe as a kid, I, I don't remember. I have some vague memories, but uh, other than that, yeah, thank you very much. Lanka, it was really mind blowing and so interesting to 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 connect uh, those three stages of the development of the Ukrainian art. And yeah, I also want to really thank Bogdan for his uh, amazing ideas and all his uh, uh, his especially for this work about Mezhigiria, which for me and taking in consideration my personal history with Mezhigiria was like I even made a screenshot because I, to be honest, I didn't know this particular artwork and it's like you know. It calls for some some even article about the role of Mezhigiria in our lives. And uh, so, but uh, to speak uh, about uh, what can be done, I think that uh, Bogdan uh, already said a lot. Yes, exhibitions are extremely important. I know that one exhibition of uh, modernism is, is uh, in the making. So there will be something. And uh, I personally made uh, several large scale museum exhibitions in Europe of uh, contemporary Ukrainian art. And I know how important it is when people see it firsthand and when they discover that it's like, wow, this is such a vast uh, traditions but it should be done on the more regular basis and yes of course the main problem is like you know one of the articles that i recently wrote was called we are only seen when we die so this is our main problem that we we only are in this uh, focus of uh, international attention when something horrible uh, starts happening and if uh, we speak about some you know more uh uh, how to say it, <laughs> more smooth uh, strategy and uh, more uh, productive one, we should we should uh, pay more attention to all those things uh, all the time. And Ukraine should be studied, Ukraine should be, like Ukrainian art should be exhibited and it should receive a, a more attention because even when we speak about books, there is a huge lack of uh, books about Ukraine, especially in the United States. Like there are some, th things that are published by uh, universities, small publishing houses, cost zillions of money, but it doesn't become like this wide uh, um, phenomenon for wider public. And it's 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 a, it's a pity because there are a lot of uh, uh, writers and a lot of artists who really deserve attention. And uh, as I see one question uh, which uh, provoked my imagination in our uh, Q&A section. Um, it says, I'm interested in learning more about how peasants, students, and revolutionaries living in the late uh, 1800s hundreds in the areas that's now modern Ukraine, so their identity as distinct from related to, or related to Russian identity and culture. Can you point me to poetry, literature, visual art, or other art that offers insight into this subject? My uh, answer will be very simple. Uh, there is one figure in Ukrainian history, which is both like, uh, uh, how to say it, uh, both uh, <laughs> sometimes uh, uh, receives too much attention and at the same time receiving this much of attention sometimes is still uh so relevant and always uh, resurrects during uh, crisis times and during conflicts and during troubles in Ukraine. This uh, person is Taras Shevchenko, both uh, both a painter, a very good uh, um, master of drawings, and also a famous Ukrainian uh, poet, and also an author of a diary. 
to be honest, after uh, being exhausted uh, by this doom scrolling and, uh, and not being able to, to focus on anything else in this life for first several weeks of this war, I started rereading uh, Taras Shevchenko's diary. And uh, it was an amazing experience because there you can see the roots of all the conflicts and all the problematics that we are dealing with today. Uh, all this, uh, first of all, Taras Shevchenko was literally a slave because he was a serf uh, and uh, uh, later he was uh, became like this outstanding uh, artist and outstanding writer and then uh, the empire was so rough on him and so like uh, cruel that uh, for a rather innocent uh, crime uh, against this empire, he was sent to, uh, to, to be a military soldier for 10 years and suffered somewhere in uh, the steppes of Kazakhstan, uh, with all my respect to Kazakhstan, but that place was particularly unpleasant. So yeah, so and you can, if you read, uh, read this diary, you can see this identity. And if you, if you, if you read the poetry of Taras Shevchenko, you can see that this person understands himself as something separate, in spite of the fact that he comes from this very, uh, like, uh, how to say, it, a simple peasant uh, uh, family that he used to be a serf, but he has this very, very strong and distinctive identity. And if we speak about artworks, it's a very long story, but uh, one of the, like, uh, artists whom I first thought about was uh, Mikola Pimonenko. It was an artist who worked in the late 19th century, and he uses a lot of uh, um, images of Ukrainian peasants in national costumes. He works with this uh, um, identity issues. And it's very interesting to take a look at his works uh, to see that, yeah, there was something something different uh, in Ukraine and yeah, and all other, like you can even read uh, uh, the hybrid as Yulia Yulchuk Ilchuk from Stanford wrote a book about Mik Mikola Khohol as a hybrid phenomenon of uh, the Imperial uh, Russia and uh, Ukraine. And yeah, even in his works, you can find out a lot about uh, Ukraine and Ukrainian identity in spite of the fact that they're written in Russian. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, um, Pisara. Thank you all. I think we are drawing to a close and by strange coincidence that Stanford is visiting Denise Ferreira da Silva, who is a scholar of um, um, contemporary um, Brazilian art with a very strong decolonial aspect to her approach to images, performance and installation. And I'll be happy to share with you uh, access to one of her articles that is exactly on the topic we're talking about. It's a critique of Marxism as an intellectual platform. It's a critique of Badiou and Zizek. And basically saying what is escaping that approach is the question about race, slavery, capital. And so when you bring race and slavery, what happens? So it is basically opens the field for new work that needs to be done new work that exposes the structure of oppression. So be it Russian imperialism or the Soviet period or the post-Soviet period. There is a combined, in a sense, that the two sides of the equation, one that one cannot escape these structures of power, but one can expose them. That is as important as, in a sense, building the historical uh, development of Ukrainian identity. I think the two go together, oppression and identity, and I think both need to be addressed. So I found that in the course of our um, webinar today, there was a lot of um, um, harmony and fluidity in the, in the exchange of ideas. I think also our structure became very liquid. And I hope in a sense this continues in the future. I know that Olenka Pevni is organizing another webinar that will be on April 21st. Um, and we hope, in a sense, that both the conversation will continue and the possibility of answers of how we could help could continue as well. Thank you all. Uh, thank you, Nicola. I also give you the word uh, to close the seminar. Yeah, maybe I, I forgot to, to thank Nicole Chardier, who was uh, very important to, uh, to, to helping uh, today to, to, to make this webinar happening from Yale, from, uh, and also Milad Gagman, uh, who has generously supported um, uh, this event. Um, yeah, I think this is a start. Um, I, I think uh, what we learned is that we 
do not know enough, you know. So, so, so uh, um, I thank you so much that uh, uh, you you showed that uh, historical nuanced uh, context is so important uh, to 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 uh, to understand um, to understand Ukrainian art. And I think, uh, as Bisara was mentioning uh, before, or was saying before. Uh, Ukraine could, in a certain way, so, so if we think of uh, uh, the concept of decolon uh, decolonization of um, uh, East uh, European studies, um, uh, could be kind of uh, uh, a center point uh, to, to to start this process and um, and. Uh, uh, yes, yeah, so, so I thank you all a lot um, for also your willingness uh, and in your enthusiasm and um, I wish you all the best, your families uh, and um, and we hope, so I hope uh, and I pray so um, that this uh, war uh, will be over soon and that no one will uh, kind of get tired of the support, but that the support for the Ukraine will even rise and um, and be strong enough to 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 break uh, kind of this uh, terrible so and this terrible war that um, yeah that has changed already uh, global politics that ha has changed history and uh, so um, yeah thank you so much. <laughs>